Howdy, everyone. Uh, welcome to the audience here at the fundraising track at Austin Startup Week. Uh, we've got three great sessions scheduled throughout the rest of this afternoon, uh, as well as networking opportunities so that you can get to know other attendees in the audience. So go ahead and in the chat right now, make sure that you're letting everyone know who you are, where you're from, who you're looking to meet, drop your LinkedIn chat, drop your Twitter link, everything that you need to in the chat right now. Uh, closing out the day, we're also going to host a founder happy hour at Native Hostel starting at 5 p.m. Uh, so this is going to be a really, really great track and really excited for everyone here to attend today. Uh, before we get started, I want to introduce myself and share a little bit about why I'm excited to be the track advisor for the fundraising track today. Uh, my name is Jake O'Shea. I'm the director of platform here at Capital Factory, where I work with Capital Factory's portfolio companies, helping them access really whatever resources it is that they need to succeed. Fundraising is near and dear to my heart because that's really how I got my start working with entrepreneurs here in Austin as part of the investor relations team here at Capital Factory. Uh, investor relations at Capital Factory is the team that helps our startups, our portfolio companies fundraise. And it gave me the opportunity to work with hundreds of different founders, helping to put them in the position to succeed in their fundraising efforts. Because of that, I've seen firsthand a lot of the difficulties that founders face when they're fundraising and hosting this track is really my opportunity to help shine a light on some of those difficulties and create dialogue between founders and funders about what needs to change and what's not working. Fundraising for early stage startups is definitely more of an art than a science, but there's not enough open conversation between the two stakeholders that matter most in this equation, which is the entrepreneurs and the investors. So with that in mind, during today's track, we've got one session that's gonna be organized by investors, one session that's been organized by entrepreneurs featuring entrepreneurs, and then finally, to end the day, we have a, a session that brings together both entrepreneurs and investors to discuss the current funding environment and really start opening that dialogue and figuring out what needs to change. I hope this track is able to provide you guys some actionable advice for the entrepreneurs in the audience on how you can be more successful when you're going out to raise funding. But I also hope it provides some insights to the investors that might be tuning in on the different struggles that founders face and how they can do better to serve those entrepreneurs. Now, before we get started, that's more than enough for me. Uh, first, I want to give some shout outs. First of all, I want to give a huge shout out to the programs team here at Capital Factory for producing such an awesome event. They've been working incredibly hard over these last few weeks, making an awesome uh, event, and they're definitely going to need some service ganja after this week is over. I also want to shout out the moderators and the panelists that we have for the fundraising track. You know, every year we strive to create an exciting and engaging event but we can't do it without community members in the audience who host and participate. Uh, and then that kind of leads me to another shout out, which is shout out to you guys in the audience, the people that tuned in today. You know, I assure you that this track will increase your chances at startup success. And so come on down to Native Hostel after the event to network with other founders and funders in Austin. Uh, also shout out to Farhaj Mayan, Umar Brema, Gordon Dougherty, Corey McCain, and Sean Simon as well, the Twitter supporters. Uh, finally, I want to give a really huge shout out and thank you to our sponsor for this track today, Latham and Watkins. Um, they really made this track possible. And with that, I'd like to invite up to the stage, Scott Craig. Scott's a partner at Latham and Watkins. And he's gonna be providing some opening remarks before we dive in with some of the programming. Hey Scott, thanks for being here today. Thanks Jake, uh, it's, uh, uh, we're really happy to be here. Uh, first, I wanna thank Capital Factory and uh, the Startup Week organizers for uh, everything. I mean, this is, uh, we're looking forward to get back in person, but uh, putting this together, you know, quasi remote, quasi in person is, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a difficult task and, and we really appreciate all the work you guys have put in. Uh, Latham and Watkins, we've, we've recently opened this office in Austin in the last month, myself, uh, Jen Smith and Sam Savaney. Uh, all of us have uh, more than 15 years of experience, you know, helping uh, venture back companies and emerging growth companies grow in Austin and in Texas. Uh, we're excited to start this office in Austin. Uh, we think it's a great platform for early stage companies as they grow and they and they develop legal needs, you know, across the spectrum of, of what what they can of of, of the issues that'll be uh, arising. Um, you know, our emerging growth practice at Latham nationally has a vast experience working throughout the United States. We've got offices in Northern and Southern California, the Midwest, New York, D.C. Uh, and, and now Texas. We're, we're really excited to be here and, and, and grow with Austin. And, and as you've seen in Austin the last five years, it's just the growth has been outstanding. Uh, Latham's going to be uh, uh, right here along with everybody to continue to grow. 
Um, we, you know, we adm we've advised emerging company clients on more than 500 financings over the last two years, all the way from very early stage seed financings to very large unicorns and decacorns or whatever you want to call them. Uh, you know, so we, we are excited to help these companies at, at every stage along the way grow and, and meet their need, meet their goals. Uh, I encourage everybody to check out our website, LathamDrive.com, uh, L-A-T-H-A-M Drive.com. It's got a number of resources and uh, materials and just, you know, information for entrepreneurs looking to start their companies, a lot of best practices and other tools there that can be super helpful for entrepreneurs. If they have questions, they don't want to really want to engage a law firm quite yet. I think it's, it's, it can be really helpful. Um, but ultimately, again, we're excited to be here. We're excited to be part of the Austin ecosystem. Uh, Jen, Sam, and I have been part of this ecosystem for a long time, and now we think we're on a platform that can really uh, help our clients and our future clients explode in, 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 in every good way. And uh, happy to talk to anybody today, tomorrow, throughout the event. Uh, I look forward to seeing a lot of you at the happy hour, hopefully, this evening. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn it back over to Jake. I'll be back at 1.30 for a Founders Fireside chat with Lauren Washington of Thunder. Sarah Poole of Box, Catherine Allo of Flow Recruit. This will be the founder panel. Really excited to hear about their fundraising experiences. Other than that, Jake, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, and thanks so much, everybody. We're happy to be a part of this. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here, Scott. Uh, and again, you know, huge thanks to you and the entire team at Latham and Watkins for sponsoring this track and helping put together some great sessions. Great. We're excited. Awesome. Well, now let's jump right into it. Uh, I think first up today, we're going to hear uh, from some of the most active venture investors here in Texas. So the first panel for today is Texas Startup Fundraising in 2021, a record-breaking year. Uh, you know, 2021 is smashing records for startup financing right here in Texas. Uh, so in this panel, we're going to hear from some of the partners at all of the most active firms in Austin as they discuss changes in the local market and also provide some tips for the founders in the audience that are fundraising. So we'll hear from Eric Engineer from S3 Ventures, who's going to be moderating this session, as well as Krishna Srinivasan, part, founding partner at Live Oak Venture Partners, Tom Ball, founding partner at Next Coast Ventures, Kit McClanahan, a founding partner at Silverton Partners, and Carrie Rupp, founding partner at True Wealth Ventures. Uh, really, really excited for this panel discussion. They do one of these every year, and it's a really, really great overview of what you should know as a founder that's fundraising here in Texas. So. With that being said, I'd like to invite the speakers up to the stage and let's get started. Really great to be here. I'm Eric Engineer from S3 Ventures and very excited uh, to be on this panel today, uh, the Texas Startup Fundraising in 2021. It's been a record breaking year. Uh, this is actually our third year doing this panel and I just wanted to thank uh, the hardworking volunteers at Austin Startup Week and everyone at Capital Factory for inviting us again. Uh, every year has been a great discussion and I'm hoping that'll be the same this year. Unfortunately, we can't do it in person. It's all virtual, uh, but uh, we hope that you'll enjoy today's session. In terms of an agenda, um, we're gonna start with some intros. So I have this great group here of local VCs that are gonna give you a little bit of background on themselves and their firms, and then I will do the same. And then we'll spend about 10 minutes. I'm gonna rush through a bunch of slides on, on data, uh, just some really interesting data uh, like I said, we've broken many records in Texas and in Austin, and it's really exciting to see. So we'll look at that. And then we'll get into some uh, a panel discussion where we'll talk about the data. We'll talk about other um, trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. So that's how we'll run the business, uh, run, run our business today. It's about 45 minutes uh, total. So uh, let's start with the introductions. I'll just go with the, the folks on the slide here. Uh, Tom, do you, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Ball. I'm the co-founder of Next Coast Ventures. I moved to Austin from California about 16 years ago. I uh, was out there after graduating from Stanford, moved to Austin to join Austin Ventures, where I spent just over 10 years. Uh, we started Next Coast in 2016 uh, and have raised two funds so far. Uh, first fund was a $90 million fund, which we raised in 2016, raised uh, another fund in 2019, which was a $130 million fund. Uh, strategy for us is, you know, we call it Next Coast because we like to invest in the Next Coast. It was a good timing thing to name that before the pandemic. Uh, about 60 to 70% of what we do is in Texas. We have deals in Chicago, Miami, Utah, et cetera. 
Um, and then from a kind of sector and stage perspective, we don't consider ourselves really sectorial. We're more thematic, um, things like the future of work, self healthcare hacking, um, but it all boils down to pretty much software and internet and tech enabled services that we invest in. And then stage or seed to what you used to call series B, uh, although I think the alphabet's gotten a little scrambled, but yeah, traditional seed to series B. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, Kip, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, Kip McClenahan, Silverton Partners. Um, Silverton is one of the more active early stage venture capitalists in Austin. I've been there, gosh, over a decade now. Um, we're investing out of our sixth fund. Uh, Silverton's fund size tends to be in the 120 range, uh, plus or minus a bit. Um, we'll be raising uh, another fund here in the next year or two, so uh, we'll continue that that pace. Uh, we like to be uh, you know, early on in your traditional seed or Series A. Um, you know, our initial check size tends to be between you know, a million or two up to four or five. Um, we uh, are, are very active. We like to take board seats, uh, happy to lead, happy to syndicate. Um, we also have a, a predominantly Austin focus. Uh, we say it's about 75% focused regionally here, and then about 25% uh, where we have uh, our network stretch into uh, other geos like Salt Lake City or New York. Thanks, Kip. Uh, Carrie, you're next on the screen here for me. Great. Well, Tom started with when he moved here, and I know mine was precisely 13 years ago because I moved here the Thursday before ACL in 2008. <laughs> um, we at True Wealth Ventures are also investing um, in seed stage companies. Uh, we are investing out of our second fund, which is a target $30 million fund. And we invest explicitly in women-led companies uh, that are improving human and or environmental health. So we're an impact fund, but you know, expecting top tier returns because of that, because of the demand for those markets. And we tend to write first checks of up to a million dollars. Um, similarly, you know, active and we prefer to lead and take board seats, but we'll syndicate. Um, we did our last two deals in Dallas and Austin, but we do invest across the country. Um, we'd love to do more deals in Texas. I think we have four total now um, out of our 13 are in this region. Great. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, Krishna? Thank you. I'm uh, Krishna Srinivasan, uh, co-founder of uh, Live Oak Venture Partners. I've been in town since the beginning of 2000 when I came here to join Austin Ventures and spent a decade at Austin Ventures and then uh, founded uh, Live Oak in 2012 uh, with our first investments began in 2013. Uh, we had a uh, today, we have invested a couple of funds now in the 100, and change, 100 million dollars and change range. Uh, we are 100% uh, focused on Texas-based companies, uh, like to invest in uh, seed, series A's, um, most typically lead and uh, co-lead th these investments. We are a full life cycle investor, which means we start with a one and a half to $4 million first check and then um, stay active and engaged and invest across multiple rounds of the company, investing <clears throat> six to $10 million of the life cycle. Uh, from a sector perspective, we are very much multi-sector uh, companies across the spectrum from, uh, 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 from uh, you know, anything that's tech and tech-enabled services across all industries. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks, Krishna. And then real quick on myself, uh, this is my second go around in Austin. I, I came here in 2001 um, to join Trilogy Software, which was a fast growing startup during the dot-com bubble here, and then um, moved away, uh, lived all over the country, and then came back in 2008 to Dallas, where I joined Seven Rosen Funds, which was a large venture capital firm there at the time. Uh, landed up joining a portfolio company in Voto, becoming the CEO, uh, grew that and sold it in 18. S3 Ventures was a investor in that company. So they were uh, my partners, Charlie and Brian, were kind enough to ask me to join at that time. And so I've been here about three years. S3 um, is a, we're on our sixth fund. It's a $200 million fund. We do seed series A and series B investing. So as little as 500K to $10 million to, to lead around. And then uh, we like to follow on for the life of a company. We can put up to 20 million in, into a company. Uh, we do mostly B2B software, but we've also done some consumer digital experiences. We've also done some healthcare tech, including med devices. 
And then lastly, I'd say we're pretty unique in that we have a single LP. Uh, so that allows us to be a little bit more patient uh, in terms of our investing. All right, well, uh, that's us. I am gonna jump next to the uh, fundraising data. I'm gonna rush through these because I think the, the most interesting stuff is the conversation. But I do think this data is, is really interesting and exciting and, and I hope all of you guys um, will, will get something out of it. Uh, first of all, we thought I'd start with some kind of just national numbers. So I, I know there's a lot on this just slide. So just to kind of help orient you, uh, the bars are the capital, uh, capital invested, so dollars invested. And the line is the number of deals in thousands. And so you can see, you know, we're going back to 2006 here, that's just been steadily increasing uh, year over year. Um, and this is the US data. But the most interesting thing here is that we're just looking at the first half of 21, and we're pretty much almost matched where we were in 20 in terms of dollars. And you can kind of extrapolate from there that uh, we're going to definitely going to be even on the count side. So 21 is definitely going to be um a record year that's going to just blow past things and almost nearly double uh where we were uh, last year so just super exciting very very interesting time in the market um which we'll talk about um as a panel in terms of the effects of something like this happening uh when you kind of look at like what's driving that uh you know we thought this data looking at quarterly and in chunks is kind of interesting so here again the bars are the dollars invested the lines are the number of deals and while the number of deals have gone up, it's clearly the total dollars that have shot up more. And when you kind of do the math, it's really driven by the size of the deals and the size of the rounds. So, we've, you know, we were at $8 million a deal in 16 and 17, $12 million in 18, 19, 20 in that period. And suddenly there's this step up where now just in the first half of 21, the average deal size is $21 million. Per deal a lot of that is driven by these really large growth rounds at the uh, in later stages uh, we'll talk a little bit about kind of dissecting things a little bit more detail later but just at, as, as a whole you can see that just round sizes are growing um in terms of texas trends um you know if you really have to be kind of living under a rock to not see all this happening but it's just been really impressive and really exciting to see tens of thousands of jobs technology jobs moving here as, as big tech keeps planning you know, either headquarters or second or third offices in Austin, Dallas, and Houston. Uh, you can see it's kind of been across the state. So a lot of talented people, you know, I know at S3 we're super pumped and we're seeing entrepreneurs with just incredible profiles um, now, uh, just given, given, given this shift. And um, you know, this was some interesting data from census data. Unfortunately, the, the latest census data that we could pull on, on migrations was 2019. So I'm sure this has just accelerated since then. But you can see that most of this migration or the largest net migration flow in the country, when you look at it between state, is, be, is from California to Texas. And I think we've all seen that. We probably all know people from California that we've met uh, in our neighborhoods and things like that that they've moved in. And that's also obviously affected the housing market. We've all seen the prices go through the roof. And this line graph kind of gives you a, a sense of the magnitude there, where Austin in particular is outpacing the growth uh, across the, the U.S. in terms of pricing. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, we update this slide every time we do this presentation, and uh, I think it's like doubled year over year. <laughs> and so now we're about, or at our estimates, about 25 billion in active capital that is that has a base here in Austin of some sort. In some cases, these are local firms like the folks that are here on this panel and ourselves, but also a lot of transplants, people either setting up their primary location here in Texas or having a second or third office here in Austin with a partner moving here. So it's super exciting time, but the, the group on the right there, the, the rightmost column is all the folks that I believe are kind of new within the last 12 to 18 months. I'm sure I'm missing some names uh, from this. I was always nervous. I'm always nervous to put this slide together because I'm going to piss someone off <laughs> by leaving them off. But uh, you know, this is, just gives you a sense of how things have exploded. Uh, when we talk about uh, with the panel, you know, some folks like myself, I was at Seven Rosen Funds, but other folks on this panel here were at Austin Ventures way before me even in, in this ecosystem and can talk about how things have changed so dramatically. Uh, and then, um, you know, where does Texas fall on, on the national scale? So if we just look at the first half of 21 uh, and we think about Texas as a single market uh, and each of the other states as their own markets, uh, we're number four right now. So uh, in the first half, we've done just over 4 billion in, in deals across 334 deals. So that's very exciting. Uh, you can see obviously California is a league of its own uh, and then it's New York and, and Massachusetts which 
um, you know, are still pretty sizable um, numbers relative to Texas. But I, I'd love to always share with people that when, when I entered venture capital in 2008, it was really Boston and, and Silicon Valley. New York was not on the map. L.A. was not on the map. And, you know, a lot can change in 10 years. So I firmly believe Texas has a shot at being, you know, at those levels that New York and Massachusetts are. And I'm sure everyone here on the panel uh, feel the same. Um, and then this is uh, just to look at the Texas data in particular. So the, the, the light blue is Austin and then the darker gray is the rest of Texas. And then we've kind of extrapolated a little bit with the gray dots there. And what you can see here is that uh, we're well on our pace uh, to surpass uh, what we did last year. But what's also interesting is we went back in time and looked at where we were at our peak all time uh, as a state. And it really goes back, you have to go all the way back to 2000 to the, the peak of the dot-com bubble. And it looks like we're gonna, we're gonna surpass that. So it looks like we are gonna now enter record territory, uh, both um, as clearly in Austin, because we're almost there, uh, but even as a state uh, of Texas. And then uh, we did a little bit of digging here to understand it by um, round. So we looked at the early stage investing. Most of the folks on this panel are doing seed A and B as you heard. And um, you can see that the, the number of deals um, is, is, is definitely going up, uh, but especially um, at the later, you know, when you look on the, on the B side, um, it's, it's the dollars have gone up, but the, the numbers have been roughly the same. So it's again, pointing to this trend, which I'm gonna go to next here, which is it's the round sizes primarily that are driving a lot of this growth. And I think we've all experienced this as investors, entrepreneurs have seen this too, where we're seeing larger rounds. The seeds have grown uh, by 93% over the last five years. A's have grown by 42% and the B's in particular, as I think Tom made an allusion, what used to be called the series B. It's very confusing now in terms of the, the, the naming here, but the B's are getting quite large compared to what they used to be. So, uh, and then lastly, I, I love showing this one. Uh, this is, you know, the fact that we, you know, we're, we're kind of, doing some incredible things here locally. So um, there have already been just this year, two locally backed IPOs uh, in Alchemy and Disco, uh, backed by S3 Ventures, Wild Basin and, and Live Oak. And then we have just increasing number of unicorns uh, being minted, uh, you know, four in the, in the last two years, which is, you know, much higher than what we had historically, as you can see. And, you know, I think, um, you know, just, just really great representation uh, in terms of the local firms and all the amazing companies. Uh, that are being um, built here and really starting to scale here, which is which is really exciting to see. So uh, I, that's it in terms of the slides. I really wanted to now kind of open it up to the panel for some discussion here. So I'm going to stop sharing. Hopefully this works, and uh, everyone can still there with me. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I thought I'd start by asking all of you. Um, you know, what, what stood out to you in that data? You know, what rings true? What maybe is missing um, from, from what you saw there? Um, maybe, uh, Carrie, yeah. uh, did you, do you have a thought there? Yeah, I guess the one thing I wanted to point out, which is, I guess, depressing but pragmatic to know, is that despite the increase in attention to women-led companies, um, because that's what we focus on, the data actually shows that it's at an all-time low in terms of the percentage. So, you know, for those of you who've been following, they've been measuring it for, you know, five to 10 years, depending on what source you look at. And it's been hovering around two to 3%. And it hit an all-time low of 1.8% during the pandemic. And it's hovering around 1.9. So, it, you know, the dollars are growing with all the dollar, you know, growth that Eric shared. But um, the percentage of women getting funded is not much better. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, even more true of minorities. So I just call that out to say, if you're a woman entrepreneur or a minority entrepreneur, it still requires more hustle and strategy, et cetera. And maybe we'll talk to some of those things later. And Carrie, is that on a percentage basis or on a dollar basis? Percentage basis. Percentage basis. Okay. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, the thing I liked about the data that I think is, is uh, positive is you look at where Austin fits and we're top five. So number four is a good place to be. If you look at the top three, as you pointed out, it's, it's like two thirds of the capital still for the first half of the year, it's a hundred billion of the 150 billion. And, you know, fourth place is less than 10% of the remaining. So, um, 
obviously, uh, you know, the California and New York and Boston are, are much larger, but I think that's just opportunity for us. And as you said, Eric, like, you know, the last 10 years ago, if you looked at that, it wasn't that, that, uh, that equal between those three markets and the top three. So while we're at 4.2 billion, I think we're still, as my real estate friends say, we're still in the very early innings of this, it feels like. Um, so I think that's uh, a great thing for us. And the second, another element of it is, I think, you know, maybe it's the, what, what, what Tom's reflecting to, I think the rate of ascendancy for us seems just much greater compared to the rest of the country here. We might just be a tad bigger than, I think it was Illinois, if I'm not mistaken, your list. But I, I feel like the amount of uh, maybe it, it's the press, it's the general attention being paid to this market from large companies, from from entrepreneurs who are moving from other parts of the of, of the country here. Um, we get uh, a disproportionate level of uh, attention in the market, which is of course translating to uh, a, a kind of a virtuous cycle here of uh, migration, not just of talent but also of capital that's happening here. Um, our companies are getting discovered much more aggressively for follow-on financing rounds here compared to, let's say, a company in uh, Illinois, uh, right, which is in the same league, and and, and you know, and uh, uh, so later rounds of financing are are more frictionless compared to before, and many other positive benefits. So the rate of change here is dramatically better compared to many of the other markets. And your thoughts, Kip, did you have anything to add there or? No, I mean, I, I think they said it right. Um, I think it's it's easier when you're starting from smaller numbers to show greater you know, percentage gains. And I think we're enjoying some of that. But ultimately, yeah, we've seen uh, yeah, the pace accelerate in everything. Um, rate of talent coming to town, rate of quality deals that we're seeing, uh, the pace at which they're able to actually scale and scale the business for real and then raise money behind that. So, um, yeah, it's a... Uh, Texas in general, Austin in particular, it's a it's as uh, wild and woolly as we've ever seen. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so, how is this changing how you guys are investing? I know at, at S three, it, 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 we tend to take a step back sometimes and say, "Whoa, what's what's happening here?" To take, you know, taking stock of of the of the dynamism uh, and and just how things have changed. Uh, I'm curious how you guys are you know approach the market or think about deals and and work with entrepreneurs. Has it changed quite a bit? Uh, Let's say five years and then the last two years, because I think, like you said, it's been accelerating and things are changing faster. Any thoughts there? I guess my input on that would be more related to just the change in the last two years of COVID and because mm -hmm. of the accessibility of being able to hop on a Zoom and that being now, you know, sort of a suitable way to do a first screen and being able to get on online conferences and quickly kind of watch the startup competition or do the one on ones that our deal flow has been, frankly, sort of insane. Um, at the top of the funnel, um, which has been great um, in terms of efficiency. You know, you're not flying to a conference, you're not going to all these meetings, you can do a lot more, but it makes it actually really hard to process. Um, and, you know, I'll be curious to see how that plays out over time with all of us so desperate to see people in, in real life. Um, but I feel like we've looked at way more deals in the last two years, just related to the online um, mm. flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, Kip, Kip said it perfectly, right? It's like it's better than it's ever been, and it's faster than it's ever been. I think it's it's it, to Carrie's point, it's quantity is off the hook. I mean, there's so many deals to look at now. Um, quality is is better as well uh, on a broad base. You know, number of quality deals is better. Um, I'm not sure percent of quality deals has gone up. Um, it's you know, there's a noise factor with quantity growing so fast. But as far as how it impacts us, I mean, it's, you know, higher velocity, faster decisions. Uh, as a former entrepreneur, I think it's better for the entrepreneurs to have all those continuing growing sources of capital in the market. Uh, th I think the good news is, is it hasn't necessarily, I mean, obviously we've had inflationary things on round, uh, round sizes and round prices, but it hasn't, you know, we haven't accelerated as fast as the coast by any means. So yeah, I think it's still a true. very healthy market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, you know, just to add to that, um, you know, it was about a year ago that, uh, you know, at least at a, from a Silverton perspective, that we started realizing that by and large, and certainly in the majority of the portfolio, <clears throat> you know, we had tailwinds versus headwinds relative to some of the efficiencies around 
and what we we're just talking about from a velocity perspective, from an efficiency perspective, Zoom works, work at home didn't destroy, you know, the cultures or, or productivity, um, you know, from a, you know, March, April through about now, maybe a little bit earlier. I think there was a, um, you know, there's some concern that uh, we didn't know what sort of environment we were getting into and about now a year ago um at least you know at, at silverton we looked around and we're like my gosh we actually uh see a portfolio performing on the whole significantly better and i think a lot of that has carried forward um i think there's efficiencies to get um realized now in terms of lack of travel uh efficiency of meeting pace of uh being able to communicate uh, from a company perspective and interpersonally um, that I probably wouldn't have necessarily predicted back at the beginning of the whole COVID cycle. But, um, you know, I think that lends itself dramatically to the velocity uh, that we're seeing right now. And we've all become much more pragmatic about distributed teams. You know, maybe some of us were in the old purist model of you have to locate companies under one roof that just creates a lot more efficiencies I, mean, I absolutely creates more agencies, no doubt about it. But uh, large companies have demonstrated how they can be incredibly successful on a remote operating basis. So we, th that level of that's given us the comfort that when you make our early stage bets, we can, uh, uh, you know, you'd like to see some critical mass together, but it can certainly be quite distributed for this to be successful and effective. Um, and, and that aperture has widened for us as we look at newer companies. Uh, one thing we've noticed is uh, the speed of some of the rounds and how they're coming together. I'm curious if, if you guys see that and how you think about that, pros and cons. <laughs> it's, it's yes, its speed has increased. Uh, it's, it's literally, we had a deal where we met with an entrepreneur for the first time it's like, well, where are you at in the fundraising process? It's like, oh, you're our first meeting, just getting going. You know, had the meeting. It's like, okay, we'll follow up the next week. It's like, I'm going to turn. It's like, wow, that did not used to happen. Yeah. Um, and uh, they didn't have a term sheet with anybody in this call. I'm not mad at anybody here. But um, this is, uh, that has certainly happened. Uh, and again, as a former entrepreneur, I think that's great. I think you got to be careful that you don't go too fast, though. Yeah, I agree with that. We we see the same thing. I think what it what it causes, yeah. Every firm I think has their own version of discipline uh, and perspective on markets like this. And if you've been doing it long enough, you've seen cycles. Um, you know that this feels like a bit of a frothy period of time um, in terms of the pacing, in terms of the valuation, in terms of the size of the round. Uh, you know, if you've done it long enough, you've seen a couple of these where it goes. You know, it goes full cycle and the music stops at some point. Um, I think if you're in the market, if you're a firm that's actually wanting to do deals, there is some reconciliation that you have to do in terms of willing to willing to participate at that particular pace, uh, perhaps willing to participate at prices that are not historically where you think, uh, you know, seems rational relative to where the company's stage and state happens to be. But uh, you can't necessarily sit on your sit on your thumbs on the sideline um, and you certainly can't enjoy the the rewards of the other end of the market the exit market which is absolutely benefiting from the same sort of uh, dynamism that exists in the early stages uh, without participating on both sides in other words you can't take you know you can't enjoy all the exits that are happening and and then begrudge the pace and timing and price of the early stage and so you know we have hard discussions but ultimately uh, we're a firm that wants to and is in market and so that means you've got to take a step forward and uh, maybe apply a little bit of additional new sort of discipline, but you can't uh, you can't sit there and, and you know, behave as you have behaved in the past and expect to uh, participate in a market as, as interesting as this one is. Do you guys find yourselves coming in earlier? Yeah, you know, well, we've um, always come in quite early um, across the spectrum, you know, homeward backed it with one entrepreneur company that was, and Disco was formed at the time of inception, along with our check into the company, et cetera, as well. It's, but, but having said that, I think this definitely forces all to come in a little earlier here, uh, because the moment the companies pick up some traction, there is a 
that same phenomenon that Tom's talking about with uh, um, lots and lots of source of capital, not just firms, you know, there are lots of these super angels, individuals who have done extremely well in the last two or three years, especially in the West Coast, who are willing to come in and write checks at phenomenal valuation of these businesses, definitely see that dynamic quite a bit. So I think it'll all force us all to just get earlier um, in, in these companies. Certainly you've seen a, a trend of uh, the bigger later stage firms coming downstream more. I, I, you know, I think everybody on this call is a pretty early stage investor and always has been. So I don't, you know, I don't know how much earlier we could go unless you start doing these pre-seed or pre-pre-seed or whatever the 18 flavors of seed are now. Um, but I don't know how we could go earlier. I think to Krishna's point, when you see the growth equity firms, it's like, oh, we used to have an ARR threshold of 10 million, now it's 5 million. And, you know, and I talked to one the other day and it's like, yeah, we'd probably go to three if it was a great company. So, so I think we see that. I frankly, you know, I, I think that's an interesting dynamic in the market. Um, and, you know, you'll ask this question later, I'm sure. But I think the, for the entrepreneurs, they got to decide who they want to work with at that stage and who can add the most value and who's the right yep. partner at that stage. I think that's a great point. You know, one, one thing I throw out there is yeah, I'm <clears throat> within a firm. I suspect the, the dynamic exists uh, in a lot of cases. I think um, you have partners that are, um, you know, have our stage and state. Uh, there's particular stages and states that they prefer. Um, yeah, I think having been in the Austin market as long as we have, we've got had the um, fortune to be able to work with a bunch of teams um, repeatedly. And in many of those cases, uh, we're able to make a team bet, uh, you know, before there's any revenue. And I think that that's a, that's a luxury. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but I do think that um, the ability to leverage relationships and, and, you know, experienced entrepreneurs to go, you know, even a, a notch earlier is something that, uh, you know, is an opportunity. I think you do need a little bit of pattern that you can match there, whether that's team or or a little bit of uh, you know market knowledge or something else. But I think that is uh, not typical. But I wouldn't be surprised if everybody's pushed a bit in that direction. Yeah, you know, one thing that has made us feel a little bit more comfortable with this is also just the the talent that has come into the state um, that helps you get a little bit more comfortable with coming in earlier. You know, um, you know, I think a lot of the pr technology problems and things that people face sometimes are happening in the Googles or the Facebooks that are pushing the envelope in terms of scale or doing something new for the first time. And those engineers and those 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 folks that worked on that are now sometimes now are in Texas versus living in Silicon Valley, and they're coming and starting those businesses. And we've seen that pattern, whether it's an Apple employee or an Uber employee recently. You know, you know that are doing that that are here now. Uh, yeah. There. So there's, I, I there's, no question, that part. there's no question the talent pool has gotten deeper. I think all of us as early stage investors would would say that we pride ourselves on the ability to add some of that talent, um, you know, into companies at the right time uh, for the right role. <clears throat> you know, and, and I think that's part of what the job is as an early stage investor. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe that that's gotten easier. Um, I think we've got more of a Rolodex to pull from. Uh, and that expands every day. But ultimately, I think that's been that's been on the agenda for everybody on this call for a long time. I just think it's gotten a, a notch easier with the influx of talent and the ability for some of these folks to have gone through the system a couple of times. Um, you know, the, it is reinforcing itself and feeding back in a very positive way. So it's a you know water levels rising as far as that goes. I think that's a really important dynamic that's underway in this market. Of course, not only are we seeing talent come in and some of the data you have, uh, Eric, is the entire uh, ecosystem here of locally grown talent has just gotten significantly better. We have companies going public, we have companies achieving scale to go raise you know, big rounds of financing. Um, not just this year, right? If you take into consideration last year, you know, BigCommerce went public last year and 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 so on and so on. And if you go the last five years, there has been a pretty healthy slug of impressive companies that have gone public and created real critical mass. So you are seeing that uh, those people have been through those companies, have been through the, are ex much more experienced. So the talent pool of just locally grown, um, you know, talent here is just, uh, 
is significantly better than before. And we are all absolutely fabulous beneficiaries of that talent, of, of, the, of that, of that uploading of talent. Great. And it, and it bears mentioning that the folks that are regionally focused, this is an especially important dynamic, right? Um, yeah, or an argument to be regionally focused because um, it, it definitely um, it definitely is getting stronger. And, and you talked about a five year look back versus a two year look back. Exactly. Um, I can remember a, a 10 year look back where, um, you know, almost universally, if you're looking for top tier VP or above talent, that was a search and you're and you're looking outside of Texas, outside of Austin to try to fill that. That line has trended dramatically down and and. I don't know the last time we felt necessary, it felt it necessary to absolutely find somebody outside of Austin versus not having at least a few at bats uh, with a talent pool here. Great. Um, well, thanks for that. Uh, I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit because I wanted to also make sure we had the opportunity to um, just talk about um, just kind of general tips that we might have for entrepreneurs um, that are maybe raising venture for the first time, um, maybe not as familiar. <laughs> with, you know, what, what goes into that. And so, um, you know, a couple of things there is like, you know, when's the right time to reach out to a venture capital firm or to, to you as a partner um, or one of your associates? How do you do that? Um, you know, what's the best way to get an introduction? And then like when you're telling your story, like how aggressive should you be? You know, I mean, that's something that always comes up in terms of, you know, you know, do I be conservative or should I be shooting for the moon? You know, what, what, how do I, how do I think about that? So I know that was a lot in one question, but I'll just open it up and people have thoughts about just how should entrepreneurs who are not familiar with this whole space think about this? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think there's a couple schools of thought on when you talk to a VC for the first time, um, and I was one who, for one of the companies I started, I never wanted to raise venture capital. Uh, so I've ironically ended up in this job. But, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it varies, right? You know, I think there's the risk of going too early and not having anything to talk about. And it's like, well, that was a waste of time for both sides. Um, and I would say I've always pushed historically, at least for deals we were already in, of like start the network and make sure the next round investor knows who you are and what you're going to accomplish um, so that when you do accomplishment and you need more money, it's not walking in cold off the street. Um, and, and I still believe in that for, you know, if you've invested in the seed or series A for the future rounds with the, the big caveat that I've kind of come to the, the realization or conclusion in the last couple of years is yes, but with the the quantity of deal flow that we're all seeing now in, in the the velocity which deals get done like at times there's like there's only so many meetings you can have a week and there's a right number probably which i seem to always go over but it's it's uh at some point it's just like look we can we can do our job pretty quickly and efficiently now so while i'd love to know you like it's got to be a pretty quick introduction versus in the past i was much more about the networking element of it mm. yep <laughs> yep. I mean, and so just to maybe riff on that a bit, um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, how, and I think it's, it's pretty common knowledge that, you know, warm introductions are always the best. Um, there's a lot of random, uh, you know, cold call email type of stuff that's happening and a warmer, warm introduction from somebody who knows, um, you know, anybody in any, uh, firm, let alone the folks on the call here. Um, is always the best way to sort of pop signal above the noise that always exists there. Um, you know, I think, you know, my, my, one of my bigger pieces of advice is I think startups that um, haven't raised funding yet, want to raise funding in the not too distant future, kind of need to have an IR perspective on how this works, right? They do need to get introduced early. Uh, they may not be ready for venture capital yet. Uh, but they need to get on people's radar screens and in a lightweight way, I agree with Tom, it's actually a, um, you know, it stands out when somebody can be very concise and crisp and, and realize the stage and state that they're in, get a little feedback. And then the IR component of that, which I think is really necessary right now, is a, is a lightweight, you know, drumbeat that the firm, that the, the startup can keep with their investor pool that keeps them informed, that keeps them in the loop that lets them, for example, be preemptive if they get excited about something. Um, that used to be sort of the purview of later stage companies, you know, series B and beyond. 
Um, yeah, I think it works. I think it works earlier now. And I think it's important because they're, you know, VCs are going to are going to get excited about, you know, portfolio synergies or going to get excited about a particular market, or maybe there's a, a team that they can, uh, they can augment in a way that, uh, you know, starts to differentiate a particular deal. And I think keeping in front of those investors in a lightweight, consistent way is one of the things that I think startups should start thinking about, even at the earliest stages. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we the last several deals we've done have been companies we met early and we have our venture fellows screening those, you know, monthly updates and looking for times when it bubbles up to say, hey, should we look at this again? And we reach out to the companies, right, to check in if they hit a milestone that we think is interesting. And to Krishna's point, we might want to get in a little earlier than we normally would or at least get on the converse, you know, be back in their radar for the conversation. Um, I wanted to also say, I mean, 100 percent. A warm introduction is always the best. I will say that for women and underrepresented founders, a lot of times they don't have the same network. Um, and so we do read the cold emails, at least from a top of the funnel perspective. Um, but know that also when we get to the filtering of the companies, that's going to you know weigh in as to if they don't have the right networks and the hustle to find an intro because we're really out there and well connected and you should be able to meet someone who knows us, then are you going to have the hustle and the networks to build your business? And so we, for example, always put all the events at which we're speaking and you know it applies a little bit more in a physical world, but everything that we're at on our you know Twitter feed and on our website so you can come find us. You know, you can come meet me and you can be the first person standing in line at the end of this panel, you know, if it were in real life or if it was, a, you know, with a chat to actually start the conversation and get an intro. Right. So, you know, some of this is about creativity and, um, you know, finding a way to make those connections. Krishna, I know you love the story about disco. Yeah. I, you know, well, <laughs> maybe I do. Well, disco, of course, came to us through a cold email um, and uh, we ended up uh, backing the entrepreneur, you know, single digit pre-money then to $3 billion market cap business now. So, so it does work uh, in, in some instances, the cold email to uh, ultimate glory here does happen. You know, so the way we think about it is like, you know, e either, either you follow the bucket of experienced entrepreneur, therefore people are willing to uh, underwrite and give you the, you know, m b m believe that you know what you're doing the second time around or you are an, uh, you know, you've got incredible domain in what you've done before, and therefore and you're doing an extension of the domain into the new play you're doing. Um, there again, you are able to underwrite these people know uh, what they're doing. And so venture folks will be willing to go earlier into those kind of instances, either because of the entrepreneur's experience as a pretty impressive startup founder from before, or they just have oodles of domain uh, that that really informs what they're about to do. And of course, that was the case with Disco's case when you had a legal tech play with a, an incredibly brilliant lawyer who was starting the company with just oodles, oodles, oodles of domain there. In the, by and large, the, uh, you know, the kind of companies which are people, first time entrepreneur doing something that's not quite related to something that they've done in life, I think the bias would be to at least see some early evidence of product market fit. Uh, meaning, can you at least string together a couple, three customers who like what you do and have uh, and 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 have, and, have, and have written a check, and there is some early success from the, the product delivering early value to you, and so on. So that ends up being the typical motion associated with these things on uh, when venture firms typically get engaged. And of course, there's all these good practices around IR as a lifetime uh, is 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 really important, but. Uh, uh, those become the typical points of intersection for institutional folks like us to engage, engage in the business. Got it. Um, another question here um, in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you choose the right partner? Um, we talked a little bit about like speed of some of these deals, right? And where sometimes um, if you're fortunate enough to have, uh, you may have four or five, six term sheets. Um, with folks, uh, what's your advice to entrepreneurs on how to kind of think about firms and, and those, well, those opportunities? For sure, reference checks on us. I think sometimes people forget um, that, you know, they're a hot commodity and they want to make sure that they're also doing the due diligence on the firm they're going to select. Um, 
And I'm not going to be offended if you do that. I'm going to be disappointed if you don't, <laughs> because I think it's an important part of, you know, your business sort of savvy to know that you want to know who you're doing business with. So we will always make introductions to our portfolio companies, but we'd also think, you know, just like we do with reference checks, you should try to also talk to the ones we didn't put on the list uh, and, and make sure that you, you know, not just, you know, do they give a good reference, but is the style and the approach of how engaged they're going to be and, and their method of communication and sort of how much they push and what they push on matches what you're looking for and what you need, you know, to complement your skill set as a team. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to really think about. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's, there's kind of two sides to it. I think one is, um, I think there's always a dynamic um, in a pitch and follow on conversations where, um, yeah, there's a connection, right? This is a early stage is very much a relationship game. You can't fire your investors. Um, you know, it's a, there's a dynamic that can exist within a firm, within a particular partner um, that's easy to communicate with. It's collaborative. It feels good. There's excitement. There's a feel component to it, which I think it really is material in the earliest stages because this is something that, that needs to be collaborative. And if it goes well, it really bodes well, uh, you know, for the future. Um, there's expertise, expertise within the partner, expertise within the firm uh, relative to what that company uh, is doing. And it may not be just rote market expertise. It might be how you plan on going to market. It might be the set of partners that you're trying to pull together. I think that's a really important component. And then there's a component um, I think Carrie is kind of referring to a little bit, which is like check, check up on us. Startups tend to not either know or feel comfortable checking under the hood as much as they probably should. And, and certainly from our perspective, would be welcome to. Um, and beyond just the reference in terms of the partner and the firm and how they work and what it's like to work with them, um, there's important questions like, where, where are you in your fun life? Or, you know, how do you, what's your reserve strategy? How are you, you know, gonna make this investment and what do you typically put back? Um, you know, what, what happens after we go, you know, to the next round? Silverton's proud of the fact that, you know, on average, for every dollar we invest, you know, over five dollars at this point are invested behind us from other investors. Those questions are fair to ask. Everybody should be asking them. Everybody should talk about what that network looks like in terms of, you know, follow on investors as as the company uh, scales. And so I do think there's a there's an ownership that startups need to have relative to their own investigation. Um, and, and I think it, it's fair. And that to me is a, those, those few things are very much part and parcel with how you, you know, how you choose the firm, how you choose the partner, uh, and how you differentiate between, um, what is an increasingly robust, uh, financing environment. Yeah. The stupid, I, I agree with everything you both just said, the stupid analogy I always use is the average good startup lasts longer than the average marriage in America. So, so you better be darn sure that you have good chemistry going into this. And by the way, you know, most marriages aren't shotgun weddings where you get married in, in less than a month, which oftentimes these relationships start in less than a month. Um, so you better do everything that Kip and Carrie just said, and then some, and make sure the chemistry is right and that your goals are aligned. You know, do we want to have children? Do we not want to have children? things such as that. Like, yep. uh, so I just, it's, it's the most, one of the most important decisions you're ever going to make. Yep. Totally. Hard to add much more to that, Eric. All right. Well, and actually we're just coming up on time here. I think we want to stay within the 45 minutes. So thank you all. Uh, really appreciated that. It was a fun conversation. I wish we could have done it in person. Hopefully we will next year. And, um, Thank you again to the folks at Capital Factory and at all the volunteers at Austin Startup Week. I know a lot goes into what you guys are doing uh, for, for the community, and so we're very appreciative of all of that. Thank you. See you Thank all. You. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Next up, we've got a really, really interesting session. We've got a founder fireside chat. So we're going to sit down with some experienced founders as they dive into a lot of the critical lessons that they've learned during their fundraising journeys, including some advice that they want to share with first-time founders. Um, so great to see all these faces here today. First, I want to invite up to the stage, Scott Craig. Scott's our sponsor with Latham and Watkins. He's going to be moderating the session. Good to see you, Scott. Uh, also want to invite to the stage, Lauren Washington, the founder and CEO of Funder, Sarah Poole, the founder and CEO of Box T, and Catherine Allen, founder and CEO of Flow Recruit. Guys, thank you all so much for being here today. We're going to have a great session. Great. We're uh, looking forward to it as well.
Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, you know, as uh, Jake mentioned, we've got Lauren, Sarah, and Catherine here. Each of them have uh, had uh, experience raising funds, and we're going to talk about you know kind of their, their companies and and what their experience has been, both engaging investors, finding investors, uh, and uh, you know finding the right investors for your company. But before we start off, I want each of them to uh, you know talk a little bit about their company, kind of where they are in the fundraising process, um, and, and and what they've been doing, and then we'll get into it. Uh, and hopefully at the end we'll have some time for questions. So, Lauren, I'll start with you uh, if you want to talk a little bit about a funder, and we'll go from there. Sure, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm Lauren Washington. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Funder, and we are a platform that automates seed investing to help move bias and maximize returns for investors. Uh, so where we are in the fundraising process, we're actually in the middle of our seed round. Uh, so it's been a little bit of a, a meta process for us as we are a fundraising platform and are also fundraising ourselves. So we're actually pulling um, every all of our investors through our platform, closing on there, transferring money through there. So it's been a, an exciting ride so far. Catherine, I'll go to you next. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Catherine, um, co-founder and CEO of Flow Recruit. We build recruiting software that employers and universities use to host both virtual and in-person interview programs and recruiting events. Uh, in regard to fundraising, we've raised $3 million to date. Um, we completed a seed and did an extra $2 million with some of our current investors uh, in prep for uh, Series A in the future. And Sarah? Yeah, I'm Sarah Puel. I'm the founder and CEO of Boxed. It's not Boxed Tea, it's just Boxed. <laughs> um, and we are a direct-to-consumer premium uh, wine brand. And uh, this is the box right here. We, um, are just, we just closed out a safe. So we did a series seed um, in early 2020. And then we decided to do use the safe vehicle rather than raise a, um, a quite yet, because we just wanted to get a little bit more going on under our belt. But to date, um, and we've also done a little bit of venture debt. So to date, debt and um, venture, we've put uh, just shy of $10 million on the board. Great. Well, uh, thanks, everybody. I think the important piece here is everyone's uh, fairly early on. Uh, and, and I know that a lot of the entrepreneurs that are at the event are looking to raise money for the first time. So hopefully some of the most re some of the recent experience raising seed and saves and convertible notes will be helpful to folks as we talk through these uh, various issues. Um, I guess, well, Catherine, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, when you founded your company, uh, did you have a fundraising plan? Like what, what, what was your first experience trying to figure out how much money you needed to raise and when and, and how? Yeah, when we first started the company, I'm not you know, I don't think we really had a concrete fundraising plan. Uh, we actually started our business while my co-founder and I were both at UT Austin. We were students. So in the beginning, it felt like we were totally winging it, uh, trying to figure out how to build the business. Um, as we got closer to graduation, we had about, I think it was like five to 10 customers, um, some recurring revenue. And that's when it became really apparent that we need to fundraise to make sure that we could continue building this business full time. So our first idea for fundraising was to go talk to angel investors. And we actually just started with a 200K check from one angel investor here in Austin. And that was probably the, the first time I learned that it really matters who you meet and bring on the journey with your business, because it makes it a lot easier for an angel to say like, hey, I've actually seen you grow through all the trials and tribulations, and I'm confident to, to give you that funds. So that was kind of the beginning of our idea of fundraising. Sarah, how about you? Yeah, I have a little bit of a different story because I wasn't, I didn't really know that I totally wanted to be an entrepreneur, if I'm being really honest. Um, <laughs> but I had been invited to be an entrepreneur in residence at Next Coast Ventures in Austin. Um, and so obviously during that time, as you're ideating, just so you know, I wasn't ideating in wine. I thought I, um, my background was in education technology <laughs> and I had really started ideating there and like in new media and some other things that I had a lot of interest in. And, and then this happened. Um, but ultimately, uh, 
that's kind of how it started. And I had some great coaches at Next Coast who, when it was time for us to think about, wow, we've got a great idea on paper and we can get a sense for what we need in order to prove if there's something there, um, we were able to kind of put structure around what, what a fundraise should look like at a seed level. Lauren, I know you're in the middle of your seed. I, you know, how, how long before you kicked that off and, you know, kind of how did you, how did you plan for that? Yeah, we had um, a pretty strong plan before we went out to raise because Funder is actually my fourth business. So I've been down this road a few times. I uh, raised immediately for my first business and kind of regretted it. Uh, my second business didn't raise at all intentionally uh, and just wanted to build that up organically. Uh, and the, the third business was a nonprofit. So we sort of, we sort of raised, but through grants instead. Uh, so this one, we really wanted to be thoughtful about when we were taking money in. Um, and I think these other two ladies uh, spoke about it where they were saying, um, when you get to the point where you know that you have a bit of a product market fit and you need a little bit of funding to sort of fuel that, um, that's when we really wanted to start uh, that conversation. So we had brought in $100,000 through the Sputnik Accelerator last year, and that helped sort of prove things out for us. Uh, but now we're at the point where we know we have a, a solid business model and are ready to scale. And for us, we, we want to use that funding as fuel, not just money to kind of play around with. Makes a ton of sense. And, and uh, you know, I think one of the things we as lawyers see when we're coming in at the end is like, uh, a, sometimes the entrepreneurs are surprised by the process and uh, you know, that the documents that go with it and, and, you know, maybe we're to blame for that, some of that, but I, I would, uh, uh, I'd, I'd be interested, you know, you know, starting with you, Sarah, like what type of, uh, what surprises did, did sort of hit you in this process? Now you were in EIC, so maybe you, you had a little bit of guidance there, but curious yeah. if there any surprises on the front end. Yeah. I mean, listen, even as an EIR at the end of the day, um, obviously next coast did come in on that seed round. Um, and, but they're still like, you know, they're protecting their LPs and, you know, making sure that they know what's going on. And so, I mean, number one, you got to have a great lawyer. Uh, and just like uh, Lantham is not my lawyer, so I'm not like plugging Lantham. I'm not plugging anybody. I, but you have to have a great lawyer and it's got to be a lawyer that you can ask real questions to. And if you don't get it, being able to just say, I don't get it and not feeling shy about it during the process, because there's a lot of new words that are coming at you. There's just no way that you could possibly know for particularly as a first time founder, um, all the things that are going to come at you that you need to understand. And you've got to have a great legal partner that you can ask questions to and not just, and then also another founder that you can ask questions to who can help you clarify things that you can then go back to your legal partner and be like, Hey, I did a little digging and a little things to understand. And I need you to unpack this bag for me or explain that again. Like, you know, a great lawyer isn't looking at the clock all the time. They know that there are some parts of it are billable, especially in these early days. And some parts of it are like, I need to give you coaching so you understand what you're doing and you have to understand. So like that was maybe, you know, for me, the, the big thing, there's just a lot of stuff. There's no way you could possibly know. Fair enough. And then, yeah, Lauren, any surprises for you along the way? I know you, you've done a couple, a few companies before that, but you know, I, I, I know there's probably a regulatory event, for instance, on, on Thunder. But yeah, curious what you what you found. Yeah, in terms of uh, going through term sheets, I, I come to Sarah. I think having the right legal team will help you avoid those pitfalls. Uh, but understanding that your lawyer's job is to help you avoid risk, so they are very risk averse, right? So understanding that when you're getting that feedback, um, that you set still then have to make your own decisions. And I think that's when the founder community comes into play where you can say, hey, this is the deal I'm getting. I know that you've uh, taken an investment from them. What was your experience like? Um, or have you seen this clause before and will it spook investors later on? So I think that's definitely um, a good balance between other founders who've been here before um, as well as your legal team. And it help you avoid some of those pitfalls. I will say okay. too, Mark, a great, a great lawyer has, I, I, I mean, my lawyer is great. I mean, he's told me some of the things like, Hey, let's think about this one because this will spook somebody in the future. And like, I would have never known to even think about that. Such a great point. Um, so yeah, that's really an important one that you're just like, Oh wait, what? That was a big surprise. Exactly. 
Yeah, hey, Catherine, that's fair. Curious, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, on your end, I know you, you had some uh, uh, pivots early on, but any other surprises for you? Yeah, definitely. We had some pivots and um, I mean, something I just wanted to highlight is that it is super important to have a great lawyer that's working with you because as Sarah said, as the first time founder, you don't know what you're looking at and the VC or even the professional angel investor has done this a million times. So they really have the upper hand when it comes to that. And you want to definitely trust your partners that are funding you. But for us, um, I mean, it was a little bit of a chicken and the egg issue in the beginning. We had no money. So how on earth we were going to hire a lawyer was beyond us. Something that we learned that I think is useful for first time founders is that a lot of um, uh, law firms will do a deal in which you can pay later. And I think that is really helpful for first time founders that want to make sure that they have someone who can guide them through the process without calling in every favor from everyone that they know, um, which we did plenty of both, but um, that was something that I think surprised us and ended up making a big difference. Great, I mean, and, and I promise that wasn't a leading question to uh, <laughs> get, get, get praise for lawyers, but I do appreciate it. I, I do think that, you know, some of the I, I, some of the most uh, I guess the toughest situations we've been in when we've had to tell clients, yeah, this wasn't done right, and now it's got to be cleaned up if you want to raise money, and it, it can be tough sometimes. There's some things you can't fix, and uh, you know most you can, but uh, I, yeah, I appreciate all of that certainly. And, and there's again a lot of good lawyers in town in Central Texas and in Texas generally that can help. Um, Lauren, you mentioned something about uh, uh, you know the ment the founder community and, and relying on that a little bit. I, I think. Um, would be curious, you know, how entrepreneurs can track down resources uh, to find other founders that maybe, whether or not the business is similar, have gone through similar experiences. Like, what are some of the resources they can use? Absolutely. Uh, there's a ton of founder communities out there. I mean, Capital Factory is, is probably one of the best here in Austin. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of ways to get connected into the, the founder community. Uh, uh, Founders Institute is here in Austin, is pretty strong. Um, there's uh, specific ones for demographics. So I started Black Women Talk Tech, which is the largest conference for Black women founders. And we also have a membership organization and we do events all the time. So I think really finding people who can understand your journey, particularly when you're fundraising, because fundraising is, is really hard. <laughs> it's definitely harder as a woman and it's definitely harder as an underrepresented founder. And so having some of that support um, so that you can uh, understand how to navigate uh, the, the roller coasters with fundraising and even just having a startup is incredibly helpful. And for me, it's the only reason I am still a founder is because I've had that community support around me. Catherine or Sarah, I'll, I don't know. How, what's your, been your experience in, in the founder community? I yeah, mean, I, I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead, Catherine. Um, yeah, I would say the same that the founder community is definitely what has helped me like get through and figure out how on earth you, you do this thing. We were lucky enough to go through an accelerator program. We went through Y Combinator. I spent a lot of time at Capital Factory in the early days meeting people. And I think both of those made a huge difference for us. Um, so when founders look at accelerator programs, I think it's just as important to not only look at the money they might be giving you, but also at the founder community and the mentor community you might be getting from it. Additionally, accelerator programs tend to take uh, a fair amount of equity. So that's sort of how you should think about um, the value that they're bringing, not just the money. But without other founders to speak to, I think it would have been way more difficult for us to fundraise because besides just being someone that you can speak to about all the trials and tribulations, they also help get you introduced into other investors. And that's the best way to meet an investor is through a founder that they've invested in. Uh, Charity shows that sort of rapport. Yeah, I would just say too, like founders beget other founders. So as soon as you've like found that one person that you connect with, they like, we just, we all keep connecting each other because it comes around. Like it's very the community is really good at helping each other out because it's a very unique, being a founder um, is a very unique spot that I could have never known what it was gonna feel like until I was doing it. And so 
that unique experience, um, particularly as you're fundraising or then you've taken money, you're going through something that really just this, this set of people are, are going through too. And we tend to like to be around each other because at least for those two minutes that you might want to be like, what am I doing? Uh, somebody else is like, I know, I know you're going to be okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So one thing, Catherine, you, 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 I, I touched on this earlier, but I'd, I'd like to hear it from everybody. You know, uh, di did you need to, as you, as you talk to investors or talk to other founders and mentors, you know, need to tweak your business model at all? You know, you don't think of details necessarily, but just, you know, what was that like? You know, you know, what uh, um, was it helpful? I mean, it, I'm curious if there were pivots made. Um, you know, how you went about that process early on when you, you think you're going one direction and then all the advice you're getting is saying, yeah, you got something there, but you need to go, you need to zag a little bit. You definitely get a ton of feedback in the fundraising process. And I personally found that every other investor conversation, I would get a like, new piece of feedback about what I should do differently and how to run my business. And you know, you spend 30 minutes with the person sometimes and it feels like all the feedback you're getting is pulling you in 15 different directions. So we never made a pivot from a piece of investor feedback that didn't later become a partner for us. That was not a source for us to pivot. We did, I think our biggest challenge in seed fundraising was less about the mechanics of the business, meaning that we sell annual contracts, it was more that it was more our market potential and getting investors to believe that this could be a really big business. Really pitching the market felt like the main thing that any seed investor wanted to know about besides just wanting to believe in the founders. And if I'm being really honest with myself, I mean, my co-founder and I, we were straight out of UT Austin. We had no track record. We hadn't even worked at a company for more than an internship. So like the team slide of our deck when we were pitching wasn't exactly the most impressive part about what we were building. Instead, what was impressive was that we had traction, we had customers and against all odds, we had some even law firm customers that are the most risk averse uh, to any, any type of customer that we could go after. Um, but really, I think our biggest challenge and what we got feedback was the market. And eventually we had to partner or really we wanted to partner with people who believed in that market potential. And that should have been our like first, uh, our first sort of filter for who was going to be an investor at the end of the day. Got it. it Sarah, I mean, whether it's a pivot or, or, or the challenges, uh, challenging feedback you receive from investors, you, know, you have an example of, of, of that at Fox or previously in your career? Yeah. I mean, listen, we didn't necessarily pivot based on feedback. Uh, one of my investors said, when anybody gives you an idea, you should always say something like, that's really interesting. I'll take that under advisement. Um, and I use it all the time <laughs> because listen, like, you know, when somebody's excited about an idea, you have like an investor and they're giving you like, they're giving you like, oh, have you thought about this or done this? Da, da, da. I mean, when it's a good idea, you'll actually get a lot of that because they're so excited that they're thinking of all the ways that they can make your business run. And my job, your job as an entrepreneur is to say, and I'm going to, that's a great idea, but I'm going to remain laser focused um, and know when it's time to layer in new stuff. And so that was like just one of like the sidebars, but oh gosh, there's, there's so much, I think the thing, and I would agree, like I had zero experience in the wine industry and um, the team slide also was lacking. I think the thing that we spent the most time on was very similar was the market opportunity and could we truly tap into it? Um, the thing that was most impactful though in our pitching was how simple we kept the deck. And we were really, there's no extra words, there's no extra, like really, you have to go through the process of having a deck that has way too many slides and then just like going further and further and further till it's like uncomfortably short. Um, and, and that was really, I think, the thing that going through that process uh, was really like any pivot that I had to make was figuring out how in less words and less words and less words, because I really did find it didn't matter that I didn't have the experience. They wanted to know if I was going to like ramrod through whatever I was going to ramrod. They call it next coast 
eating glass. Like they just, that's it. Like the, the, the pitch, you know, conversations end. And the first thing they ask each other is like, this person going to eat some glass to make it happen. And, um, I clearly did because I ate all the glass and put my wine in a box. So, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's really the biggest thing. It's like, how are you going to present that? Like, that's what you have to be able to do is just like go in there and get weird, you know, and just like own it weird in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lauren, <laughs> that's, Lauren, I mean, I, I'm curious your thoughts as well. I mean, I, I know, um, you're, you're not, you're on both sides of it, right? You're, 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 you're trying to raise money and you're seeing entrepreneurs also try to figure out what to do. Um, you know, what are some of the challenges you've, you've faced? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with, with what's already been said. I think you're always going to get advice, not just from investors, but from anyone you talk to your business about. Someone is going to say something about yeah. what you should do. And if you follow it, you're you're going to just get lost, right? So you have your North Star and you really need to be able to understand where you're going and what makes sense. For us, it's a little different because investors are our customers. And so I always put customers first. So when we're talking and they're giving me feedback in terms of the platform, that's it's sort of a dual conversation for me. It's a customer conversation and it's also an investor conversation. So um, for me, I take that and, and use it a little bit differently. One thing that we have had to do is really prove out um, our business model. So we didn't change the business model necessarily, but making sure that we could prove that uh, we could get that repeatable revenue that people would pay these prices, um, that there was an easy um, uh, conversion in terms of customers. And so that's something that we've had to do over the last few months to sort of show, yes, we can turn this into a huge billion dollar business. Got it. Yeah. I think one of the things that we, we see a lot of entrepreneurs do early on, especially if they've got what they think is, you know, a, a very, you know, disruptive technology is attack kind of every which way and and uh you know maybe that can work sometimes but we, you know i think historically you know we'll we'll see the entrepreneurs that focus on one or two segments first and really and really kind of uh you know attack those segments try to dominate there then they can scale and look at other things if you if your focus it certainly helps now there's there's certainly technologies that can go the other way but that's that's been our our you know experience when we're representing companies is the more focused they are on an, on an individual segment, you know, the more traction they get initially because you're not, you're not spreading yourself so thin. Um, you know, one of the questions I was going to ask is, is your view on the investor community in central Texas and Texas writ large, just uh, um, things that, because there's probably some investors on, on the call too. And I want, I, I, Lauren, I appreciate that your customers as well, but just things that uh, you'd like to see from the investor community uh, in Texas, as they try to support local entrepreneurs, are you know, are there things they could do better? Are there things they're doing well? Um, it's a very unique uh, uh, um, geography. Uh, you know, we work a lot with Silicon Valley and the West, in the East Coast, and Austin's got, uh, in, a, in mostly great ways, a unique. Uh, uh, it's a unique experience for entrepreneurs. But you know, Lauren, I'll start with you. I mean, are there any, anything, any good or bad that you kind of see from the investor community in, in the state? Yeah, I've been really excited to see the growth in the investor community, particularly over the last couple of years here. Um, I What I would love to see happen is just more of a focus and effort on diversity. So there was actually a really great article that came out recently in the Austin Business Journal um, around some of the pledges that were made last year and whether people were actually meeting them, not just here in, in Central Texas, but nationally. Um, and I think that there is still that needs to be that focused effort to make sure that we're bringing equity to the space, not that we are um, giving out charity to people, but making sure we understand how bias comes into play when you're making decisions, uh, when you're moving through the process, when you're writing these checks. Um, and I think because our community is growing so rapidly, we have the opportunity to really set an example now for the rest of the nation that we can actually grow and also bring equity to the space. That's great. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and Sarah, I'm curious, you know, you, you've been working at, you know, in residence and in one of the investors in town, but just generally your view of, of, of the growing and, you know, changing investor landscape in Texas. I mean, I would just say that I feel like, and I moved to Austin from San Francisco. And so I'd been immersed in 
kind of the tech universe and all of these things of, of the money that was flowing around the Bay Area. And I would say that I feel like my personal like feeling is that in Texas, there's a little bit of the uh, the friendliness of the South that comes into it. And while like obviously investors are looking very deeply at everything, I just feel like I've had so much support and mentorship in this community that feels different from the experience that I've seen some of my friends go through on the West Coast. And just like the amount of people who they invest in things that they're they also like and they use themselves. Obviously, that happens everywhere, but they they really get involved. And I've been fortunate that the investors that we have have been very hands on, always available. And they're super active, not in telling me how to run my business, but coaching me when I need coaching, be, you know, just like introducing me to people. I just like I've been really welcoming me into the community. Like I've been really, really, really impressed with with everybody that I've interacted with in and through Next Coast, but then also people that have extended out from that network and beyond. It's it's kind of incredible. So I don't I don't have any I need them to do more of. I also I think Next Coast, I just like I just need to say about Next Coast, I think they they do an incredible, they they do a lot of work on investing um outside of like the traditional box of people that uh we've seen from the past. And I mean I know that the uh Mike who's on our board, he's also on the board of a bunch of other female entrepreneurs and he's just really couldn't be more supportive. I, I'm just like, I love next coast. I not to make this a plug for them, but they're, <laughs> there's the best. <laughs> yeah, Catherine thoughts from you on, on, on the, on the, your, your experience with investors. Yeah. I mean, I would, I think I would agree with Sarah uh, that what is really special about Austin is that it is, relatively easy to meet people if you put yourself out there and go meet those founders that can get you introduced to investors. I definitely found that once I was finally like asking for the introduction or signaling, like, hey, I think I might be ready to go meet with whomever, I was able to get that introduction and get my foot in the door. I mean, once your foot is in the door, then it's totally up to you to, to make sure that that deal gets closed. But that is something that I love about Austin and I hope it doesn't change as we see so much more capital come here. Um, but yeah, definitely people are willing to, to meet even while we were still seniors at UT Austin, um, Banu and Krishna at Live Oak met with me for dinner. And I thought that was sort of like the coolest experience. And at the time I didn't realize that that was planting the seed for them later to participate a lot more, uh, you know, fully in, in our fundraising, but that's kind of one of those magic moments that you look back on and say like, wow, if I hadn't met those people for dinner, if they hadn't been willing to meet the, the college senior, then probably it wouldn't have happened that we weren't able to raise the round. So I just hope we continue with the Texas friendliness, even when we see more capital and more entrepreneurs come here. Great. great. So uh, one, uh, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, founder, other founders, lawyers, uh, investors, you know, what are some other, uh, uh, resources that, and we talked about capital factory and, and some of the incubators people have been involved in, but what are some of the other resources you've relied on to help grow your company and help, help, uh, raise money, help, you know, you know, button things up, you know, uh, so to speak, Catherine, I'll start with you. I mean, I just, I'm curious if there's other, other groups in the community that have been crucial to helping, uh, flow recruiting. I mean, so many people. For me personally, I, I'm quite like relationship driven as a person. So I think for me, it's mostly been the founder, founders and mentors that we've met that have helped me gain the confidence that we can continue to build this business. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, Jan Ryan, who is a mentor of ours, has been really instrumental. AJ Bruno is the founder of a company called Trendkite, now uh, is the founder of Codapath. Both of them have invested so much time and energy uh, into me and into our teammates to take us to the next level. Um, folks from Live Oak, like, for me, I think really it's been relationship driven um, and we're lucky that we met people. But I guess the, the, the resource that folks should think about is that, you know, going to the happy hour later today, it's not just about the like free booze and open bar. It's also about who you're going to meet there. And uh, that's something that I, I look back on and realize that was the biggest uh, indicator for our success. Lauren, I, I turn it over to you. Uh, you know, outside of what we've spoken about, other other types of resources that have been very helpful. 
Yeah, I would definitely say accelerators. So I think Catherine mentioned Y Combinator. Sputnik has been incredible uh, in terms of a resource for us and support and advice and connections. So um, definitely making sure that you have an accelerator that is going to do all that for you, not even just the time that you're there, but afterwards and build that community. Um, I would say advisors as well. Um, the Funder is the first company where I built an advisor board um, and now I'm reaping the benefits of it and understand that having people who can really help guide you and make those connections for you um, is so critical. And that was something that was definitely missing, at least in my first company, that we didn't have a, a set advisors around us. Um, so I would say those two are probably um, additional resources that are, are helpful. And I would suggest most new founders uh, try to, to find as well. Yeah. Sarah, I'll turn over to you. Yeah, I mean, listen, also the chamber, I would, you know, I think the chamber sometimes, not necessarily just in Austin, but in general, it's like, ooh, the, the, old, the old guard chamber. But the reality is the Austin chamber is really awesome and they do a lot in the community and they are absolutely excited to um, partner with startups and inter make introductions and it's not, um, it's not expensive to get involved in the chamber and they've just got so much going on. And I think it's, especially now that we're kind of coming back into people getting together, I think it's a great place to tap into and just cold call, you know, and get some stuff there. I agree with the advisor thing um, as a, I didn't end up going through the SKU program, but that's an accelerator. If anybody's listening, that's doing uh, consumer packaged goods. I think they're, I mean, best in class. And I met them and, you know, I'd say uh, to Catherine's point, everybody you meet, the reality is, is people want to help you. Like, that's just a fact. I mean, unless you meet a really mean person, but if you've got a great idea that you can articulate simply and it just makes sense, people want to help you. Uh, it helps us if it's a wine company. So if you need me to send a box of wine to somebody, let me know. Um, but like, you know, you just asking, you can't be afraid to ask you know, and meeting somebody for a coffee and getting getting involved that way. It's like every single person I meet that I tell what I'm up to, they're just like, what can I do to help you? And if you're serious about this path of being an entrepreneur, you better know what you're asking them to help you with. Um, and make it be one thing, make it be really simple because they want to do it. Like they just, people want to help you. Great. And then like one last question, we'll turn it over to, we got a few questions from the audience, but um, when you are going to talk to investors, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about having that, that, that short, concise slide deck that really only has the points you need, but what are some other things you need to be prepared to have uh, when you talk to them? I, I, and, you know, cause I think, and I guess that there's sort of the ancillary question to that is, when should I go talk to investors? Uh, you know, it, it, can it be too early sometimes? And I, I think, you know, people have different views on that, but you know, Lauren, I'll start with you. You know, what are your thoughts there? I would say um, before you talk to investors, do your research. So don't spray and pray and think that you should just talk to any investor and, and hope that they latch on to you. Um, really understand what stage they invest in, what space they invest in, um, and, and make sure you understand other companies that are maybe similar to yours because it's it's terrible. You don't have a lot of time as a founder to fundraise because you're also still building your business out. So it's terrible to sort of waste time talking to someone and also to waste their time if you're not a right fit. Um, and a lot of founders sort of make that mistake in, in the early days. Um, as, as far as being too early, I think you can be too early definitely for a certain stage. Um, so understanding where you should be in terms of uh, monthly recurring revenue or annual recurring revenue or traction um, that typically happens in those stages. Yes, there are some exceptions to it if you have an incredible founder or different, you know, the industry is booming in a certain way. Um, but generally those guidelines are, are correct. So looking into that and understanding where most companies are before you start talking to someone in uh, who's investing in that stage will again, just help you save time um, and make sure you're really laser focused on, on your um, targets. Sarah, thoughts on uh, engaging investors? Yeah, I mean, listen, I totally agree with everything Lauren said. Like you do have to know what stage people are at. I mean, that's definitely something that I, you know, you hear, you're like, well, when you get to here, give me a call. And you do need to make sure you're nurturing those relationships. And it's good in the early days to learn some of that stuff and have some of those conversations because it does give you the experience to know what you're getting into in the future. 
Um, but part of the question was, is it ever too early to talk to investors? It's never too early to network. Now you have to be, you know, and like create and build relationships, but you should also know that you shouldn't be pitching your idea unless it's fully baked or you have enough information to really be. So like you should make friends. You should always be building your network. You should know when it's time that you've, you're not just starting the work right in that exact moment to build the network. Um, in fact, I was having lunch yesterday with a founder who isn't quite ready uh, to do uh, a series A, but she will be probably in the next six months. And so, you know, I'm going to take an opportunity to set up a fun little happy hour where, you know, she can casually meet people without it being a formal pitch and presentation. And I think that's the type of thing, you know, you should be looking out for. Start collecting all the cards. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that for sure. Um, I, I think to, you know, both of y'all's point, I, I do think that it can be too early to have an investor conversation. Like you get excited, you accept, and then maybe you didn't spend enough time preparing. Like what is your less than 60 second, what your business does and where do you see it moving? And can you articulate that concisely? Uh, it's important to remember that, you know, the investor that you're speaking with has probably heard pitches of every company and yours sliced like five different ways. So if you're not grabbing their attention in that short, concise moment, then you're probably, they're just going to hopefully let you talk for a little bit, but you're not having the best impression. So I think, I wish that we had spent a bit more time intentionally preparing those, those short kind of snippets about what we're doing and where we're going before we had sat down to have coffee with investors. Um, to Sarah's point, it is definitely never too early to network, but sometimes I found myself in situations where I would think like, oh, we're just getting lunch or coffee and then realizing like, actually that was my first meeting. And I yeah. wish I'd been more prepared to yeah. show up and say what I wanted to communicate. I, I think in, in my experience, it, it, it's never too early to network. Um, it, but it can be too early to pitch, like like Sarah mentioned and, and Catherine said. And I think, um, you know, just you kind of have to have good judgment about what the expectations are when you meet with potential investors. Because if if you're super early, again, it's probably just better to to, to exchange business cards um, at that point if you're not fully buttoned up. Because uh, I have seen situations where companies wanted introductions early, we made them, they, they just weren't ready yet. And then, you know, a year later, there's still that kind of, view from what the company was a year ago. And sometimes it, it, it's hard to get past that initial meeting. It really was a pitch. But if you're just networking and say, I've got something, let's talk when I'm ready. It actually can like, you're playing a little hard to get in, in a sense and you're not ready. So, uh, you know, th that, that's helpful. And, and it, can, it can create some curiosity among the investors. But yeah. there's a law firm that I'll just put out there for entrepreneurs is we get all, often asked to make introductions to VCs. We've got a huge West Coast presence, a huge East Coast presence. We've got relationships with all of the venture capital funds, but kind of a red flag to me is when we get engaged simply to make the introductions. And I think if you're going to ask your lawyers or your accountants or your service providers or anybody to make an introduction to a, a fund, you should have an idea of who the partner is at that fund that you want to meet. Why do you want to meet that fund? Because they, they invested in a company like yours. Okay. Who was the company on that board? Um, so those are things to consider. Try to get a more precise introduction. And, you know, I, I know as a law firm, we're, we're happy to do that if we if we if we can make the connection and we've got the connections, but the more precise it is, the more useful it's going to be for you. The more likely that the fund is going to want to even take the introduction. Um, we had a couple questions from the audience. Uh, you know, one's a general one, so I'll just I'll, I'll start with uh, Catherine, and we can go from here. It's you know, when you've been act actively fundraising, what is something that you didn't consider? And maybe we covered this a little bit, but we'll we'll uh, see if any if there's anything to add. Hmm. Didn't consider. Um, I mean, I think I covered this, but I don't think that we fully considered how strong of a, uh, influence our network was going to be. And I know that I already spoke about this, but it really, it just helps to build relationships because it helps build that trust, especially when you may not fit like the perfect mold of what the founder is supposed to be for that company. If you can build that trust with someone well before you're going to fundraise, then 
you already have a leg up when they're wondering if they should consider to make an investment or not. So I found we were far more successful when we were talking to folks that knew about Flow Recruit and had seen us go through different pivots and had seen us come out of those. Like they saw us eat glass and like live to tail the tail. And so they were so much more excited about investing in what we were working on. We did not consider that before fundraising. I did not understand how the network was going to play into who ended up being on our cap table. But looking back and for future rounds, I, I do think about that actively, like who might be that person. Yeah, Lauren, did, I, any thoughts on things you didn't consider as you're raising money? Um, I think just building up uh, thick skin <laughs> is something. So I've, I've been here before have gotten the rejections before, but I think uh, doing it again almost eight years later and remembering the sting of rejection, you're going to get no's from investors. Like not every investor is going to invest in you. They usually only do a couple dozen a year and they get thousands of companies. So keep those stats in mind when you're talking that it, and then it also might not be a good fit. And you wanna have that partner who's truly gonna be a good fit for you as you're building this business out because it's a long-term relationship. So I think just being ready for the no's um, and, and realizing that it's not an indictment on you or your, your company is is really important. Sarah, any, any thoughts from you on, on, on? Yeah, I mean, I just say, listen, I think fit is a very like big takeaway from this whole thing when it comes to taking money from somebody else, whether it's venture or an angel or somebody else, it is their money. And like, you know, I'm protective of my own money. And so they are going to be protective of their money. And so you want people that that are you're OK getting a text from in the middle of the night uh, and, you know, things like that. And so it's you are a steward of their money and you need to take it seriously and you need to think very carefully about who you take it from because they are your business partners in a lot of way. And I'm, you know, technically a solo founder, but I am a solo solo founder that would not be here today if not for the investors on my cap table and they are my business partners and you know they're on my cap table so they're not going anywhere they're not somebody that i can uh, just terminate you know and so it's really 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 important to choose wisely it is not just a one way street and so while there's a lot of rejection in fundraising um you just say thanks when somebody rejects you because it probably wasn't going to be great anyway, because it's not a fit for whatever reason. Makes sense. It's it's a, like um, I think we're out of time, but um, I, I do want to thank Lauren, Sarah, Catherine uh, so much for, for doing this. Uh, you know, it, it was great to have uh, a group of founders that have been, have gone through this so recently. And, and uh, um, I, I imagine there's a number of uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and future entrepreneurs on online right now that have uh, learned a lot today. Um, hope to see everyone at the happy hour this, this evening, if you're able to make it, but, um, I, I know Jake's going to join here in a second, but, uh, uh, again, re really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again so much for all the panelists for sharing y'all's perspective and experiences. Also, uh, so sorry, Sarah, you're the founder and CEO of Boxed. I <laughs> just is giving you a little bit of hell. <laughs> that was a silly mistake. Um, anyways, thank you guys so much for being here. That was a really great panel. All right. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one, Catherine. Um, but first, we have one final session for today. Uh, and this is one that I'm personally really, really excited about because it brings together both investors and entrepreneurs to basically have a candid discussion about the current funding environment and what we can do to change it or improve it. Um, so this third session is our Women in Venture panel. Uh, and just to kind of set the stage for you guys, according to TechCrunch, women-founded startups actually deliver a 62% higher return on investment, generating twice as much revenue per dollar invested and taking one full year less time to exit than other startups that don't have female founders or female leaders. Uh, in the past five years, VC investment in women-owned tech companies has increased steadily, but once COVID hit, investors kind of retreated back into their referral networks and started making more quote-unquote safe investments. VC funding for women actually shrunk drastically during that time. Uh, so crunch-based data shows that of the more than 800 female-founded startups globally, they received a total of $4.9 billion in venture funding in 2020 through mid-December. 
Um, and while that sounds like a big number, it actually represents a 27% decrease over that same period. So today we're going to have lots of you know female entrepreneurs and female investors on stage to kind of talk about the scenario and figure out what do we need to change, what do we need to do better. Uh, so I'm excited to bring up onto the stage Holly Tikovsky, Lisa Besserman from Expa, Bree Crickshank from the Radical Girl Gang, Janice Omadiki from the Mentor Method, and Heather Buffo from Republic. Ladies, thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited to to hear this panel. Thanks, Jake. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh-oh, I think Holly froze. Give it a moment here. <laughs> it wouldn't be a day in tech without some dramatic freezer outage, right? Very true. <laughs> I'm actually glad you guys are still like getting StreamYard to work for the most part. I was part of another conference that had to like completely go off of StreamYard because it just could not work yesterday. StreamYard needs to integrate those like Zoom filters, like the background and the skin tone. Yes. So I'm like, uh -huh. oh, I have for the background and hair. Like I got to actually <laughs> that. <laughs> well, for everyone who's here, thanks for coming. I'm excited to answer some questions once we get Holly back, but hopefully y'all are having a great start to your Austin Startup Week. Bree and Lisa and Janet. Did you guys go to any of the other sessions today or yesterday? I was very fortunate to be a judge um, at the uh, female founder $100,000 pitch competition. So that was incredible. We had a lot of really amazing founders pitch a wide array of sectors. So it was a lot of fun and um, got to meet really incredible founders online. Um, but it was, it was a really awesome opportunity to participate. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, I was supposed to announce the winner yesterday, but then the event got postponed to November 10th. So I'm looking forward to seeing who wins and watching all of the pitches and everything. Yeah, it was. they were all incredible. Um, everybody's a winner in my book, but yeah, of it was fun to see that. Looks like Holly's back. Hey, welcome back, Holly. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It's like all excited and I had a sassy comment to start off <laughs> with and like it took me down. Um, I was going to say that like, if you're returning money a year faster with two X, the revenues, that sounds like a dadgum safe investment to me. So true. <laughs> but so we're so true. <laughs> awesome. So I'm so glad uh, to be with you guys today. Um, I have a foot in both worlds being a, a founder and a, a funder. I think my heart is still in the founder camp though. I have, uh, but why don't we get get started? Uh, Bree, you want to tell us a little bit um, about RGG, Radical Girl Gang, and what you're up to? Absolutely. Thank you, Holly. Um, great to be here, everyone. My name is Bree Crookshank. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Radical Girl Gang. We are the online marketplace to discover, support, and shop emerging women-owned brands. Um, my background is at Nike and Outdoor Voices, and essentially, um, when I started pursuing entrepreneurship, I realized that, you know, just like we're going to be talking about today, there are massive inequities in this space. Um, and women entrepreneurs, in particular, at the earliest stages of their ventures, have a very difficult time breaking through those barriers. So um, essentially, we are here to level the playing field. We make it super easy for customers to find absolutely incredible products from women-owned brands all across the country so you can vote with your dollars. And we make it really easy for brands to be able to break through that noise and gain access to customers that want to support them and shop women owned. And I have been on the site and done some shopping myself. There is no better place to find a, uh, a crocheted ovary door hang. <laughs> the, the yes, we call that the cuterest. Yes. Yes. So Excellent really point, awesome Holly. stuff uh, at RadicalGirlGang.com. So Janice, tell us about what you're doing at the Mentor Method. Happy to. I'm Janice Omadecki, CEO and founder of The Mentor Method. We're an HR tech solution focused on talent retention and development through the proven power of mentorship. So in layman's terms, um, we have a software that helps match talent to mentors inside of where they work to make workplaces more inclusive and representative of the lovely individuals on this panel today. Yeah, and so for everybody today, we've got two folks on the, the founder side and two folks on the funder side. And so we'll switch over. I shouldn't say side. That acts like we're across the table. And we're not, right? We're, right. we're on the same side of the table. So 
That's right. Uh, hey, Lisa, do you want to tell us uh, what you're doing at Expo? Sure. So I'm what I would call a recovering entrepreneur turned <laughs> capitalist. Um, so I've been on, on both sides of the um, same side of table. Um, but definitely have seen um, seen how to operate on both sides. And I think that's it's been really um, very valuable in, in how I look at investments. Um, but just to give you a bit of background, I'm the managing director at Expa Venture Capital. We are a $350 million venture firm. Uh, we're led by Garrett Camp, the founder of Uber and StumbleUpon. And so we invest anywhere from um, pre-seed to Series A startups. I am running the pre-seed program. So I work with founders at the earliest stage of building. And we're building out a, an accelerator model within a venture capital uh, firm. So we work very hands-on with founders. We help them, you know, with um, building out their product roadmap, hiring, customer discovery, um, finding new users. So we're very deep in the weeds and we get very involved. We see it as not just a, a financial partnership, but also a strategic partnership when we're doing investment, um, especially at the earliest stage of the pre-seed. Uh, prior to Expa, I was the head of um, program at Indeed's Incubator. So I uh, have been in the incubator space for quite a bit. And then prior to that, I was a founder myself as the founder of uh, Startup Buenos Aires, which was an early stage startup accelerator program in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And we provided um, access to education, resources, community, and financial capital to founders throughout Latin America, primarily in, in Argentina. So I've worked with founders, um, thousands of founders throughout my career, uh, specifically in the incubator accelerator space. And now I'm really excited to be um, on the venture side and, and really being able to invest in, in founders um, like these wonderful women on this panel and other underrepresented founders as well. It's a, it's a big passion point of mine. And it's really giving a voice and a platform and funding to people who have yeah. historically had that opportunity. Yeah, it's more than a voice, right? You know, some money helps. Yeah, put, put your money where your mouth is. That's what I tell all my investor friends. Yeah. But that's cool, the, the idea of the access to the know-how as well as the, the capital. And, and Heather, tell us what you're doing at, at Republic. I would love to. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so I, my name is Heather Buffo. I am the Venture Growth and Partnerships Lead at Republic. So Republic, if you're not familiar, is a crowd investing platform that gives you the power to invest in the future you believe in by providing access to private investments in startups, crypto, real estate, video games, and more. Um, we were founded in 2016 as a spin out of AngelList when Title III of the Jobs Act was passed, which permitted equity crowdfunding as a form of fundraising. So when I explain this to people, I like to walk it back to the SEC and the Great Depression. <laughs> but the SEC was, in, was put together in 1933 following the Great Depression when a lot of Americans lost all their wealth because of bad investments. So the SEC was developed to help regulate um, the stock market, basically, and uh, public investing opportunities to protect investors. And one of the protections they put in place when they were founded was to um, not allow people without a lot of wealth to invest in private companies because they are very high risk, but they're also high reward, which basically meant that the wealthy elite already had access to an investing class that allowed you to grow your wealth in significant ways in much shorter timescales than um, the public market markets are capable of. So in 2016, following the Great Recession, um, the Jobs Act was passed, or excuse me, in 2012, the Jobs Act was passed to help um, stimulate the economy and make it easier to build businesses and fundraise. And then this particular um, title was passed in 2016 to open up the investing opportunity to more people. So we are here to democratize access to capital for founders, um, to give founders the opportunity to raise money from not only venture capitalists and angel investors, but also their customers, their parents, their friends, anybody who has been their early champions and have helped them get to um, their early traction points. So um, in my role, I help us execute on that mission by working with investor partners like Lisa and others to find great companies to raise on our platform um, and make sure that we're able to support founders across the board. I also run our venture partner program, um, which is a community of now 170 professionals in the startup fundraising world that are uniquely dedicated to this mission of democratizing access to capital and help us do that in a lot of different ways. You know, Heather, just listening to you talk right there and all all four of you, like, could y'all be more excited, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing, right? More passionate and full of uh, joy and mission, you know, it just, it makes it so much easier when you believe in your, what you're doing. Okay, I want to throw out our first question. So, let, okay, so, so what we know is that today, 
um, uh, so I guess two years ago, there was women led businesses were 2.8% of the funded uh, capital that went out. And that actually went down, uh, as Jake was starting us off with, to 2.3% last year. In our minds, let's say that it's 10 years from now, it's 2031, and the number is like 10x, it's like 25%. We haven't even gotten all the way there, but it's 10x of what it is today. What did we do today that got us? <clears throat> like, what did we do? What did we like, like, oh man, you know, 2021 was the year that it all changed because we started... Right, because we know, and I don't think anybody says, "Oh, two point three. That sounds about right." You know, like, I don't think we're saying that. Everybody's yeah, like, that's terrible. It's basically like half the innovation, not you know, the opportunity in our in our economy not being taken advantage of. You know, and when you look at uh, Black women founders, it's I, it was an all time high, and it was zero point three four percent. Right, that's nuts. So, what did we do? then 10 years from now, it's like the trajectory is amazing. I don't- think, I can, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, uh, I don't think it's one thing we did. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I certainly don't think that there's a lack of talented and incredible women entrepreneurs. What I think there is, is there's a lack of talented and incredible, well, not, not lack, but there's a lack of seats at the funding table for women yeah. who understand what women like the purchasing power of women products that are built for women and when you're pitching to men it's really difficult to be able to convey that it's really difficult to get access to that financial capital so i think the first thing we need to do is have more women and and um, diverse thoughts at the funding table so the people who are responsible for writing the checks and making those decisions and being able to um you know believe and and fund and, and invest in those women i think that's going to be a huge game changer. And I'm not just talking about investors and VCs or angels. I'm mm -hmm. talking about LPs as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that's other people that you're also answering to and, um, you know, in, incorporating into your investment thesis. So I'd say like one of the biggest things that we can do is have more investor, women investors. More I think the number right now is 5%. It is. Um, an, Inc, yeah. an Inc article said that 5% of VCs were women and 12% of the decision makers were women. Yeah. But, but again, I think that that's... Um, that's that also on the rise, but also really small. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'd say like the number one or one of the most important things is just having more female decision makers, investors that are being able that are able to take those bets on women products and and women entrepreneurs that understand that women are just as capable um, and in some other ways more capable than their male counterparts that might be building companies as well. Um, another thing I'd say is education. So focusing mm -hmm. on in, in creating an inclusive environment for women in STEM. Um, so more women entrepreneurs, more women product managers, more women entrepreneurs, um, engineers, et cetera. Uh, so I think it's, it's also, it's like a mix of like education and investment that we can, that we can incorporate to, to change the, the atmosphere and to help us get to that 10 X, which still is a long way to go. Um, and still not, not nearly good enough, but, um, it's definitely a step in the right direction. I agree with you, Lisa. I think too, expanding on the education piece. I know for me in the mentor method, right? We've had to go some non-traditional pathways to scaling, fundraising, and all aspects of team building, all aspects of building the company to where it is now and to where it's going. So being able to educate people on the fact that there isn't just one cookie cutter way. And if VCs are saying, well, this needs to be, you know, this is the standard or Okay, a good example is when I moved to Austin from DC in 2018 for the Maths Challenge Accelerator, they had a great um, session for women-led businesses. And it was led by a woman VC that came in and explained the differences in how women have to pitch and the way that men have to pitch. And it wasn't in sort of a commiserating, you know, woe is us, environment, it was like, look, here's what you have to do. Put your team slide immediately after your title slide because they will discredit you until they realize that you have a team and you're credible. Next, make sure that you're talking about these pieces. Wrap it up with this. In your appendix, include these slides because they will discredit you and not think that you have, you know, make maybe think that you're making up stats, etc. So like to this day, 
any time that I update my pitch, which I mean, quite honestly, feels like a daily practice at this point, <laughs> if I find another data point that supports our plan to scaling in the market, I make sure that I have that in my appendix as one of my source URLs. So that if someone's like, I don't believe that quote exists, which because that has happened, right? I can say, oh, okay, well, slide X has a whole library of resources. And as you can see by the footer, you know, this is the source, take a look at it, whether or not you choose to believe, you know, Forbes, Entrepreneur, Diversity Inc, and other credible sources is your decision. But you I say with a smile on your face. It's your decision. <laughs> it's your decision. <laughs> One thing I do want to add to that, which as a founder and seeing, you know, hundreds of decks, that's hilarious. Like, it's crazy to me is women are very realistic about their projections. And what you just said just mm -hmm. validated that. Like we have mm -hmm. data, we have facts. We're not being aspirational in our like, what right. is the total addressable market? Like when you compare a fee like a female founder deck to a male founder deck, like the male founder deck is like absolutely like crazy projections like the tens mm -hmm. get one percent of the market type yeah. stuff. i mean and it's just it's <clears> funny <throat> like we've i've had this discussion with other female investors where it's just like the female decks are so accurate or like very conservative in their projections and because they err on the side of like accuracy whereas the male decks are more like aspirational huger tams or huger sams whatever it might be um, mm -hmm. And it's funny because that goes, uh, it's very aligned with what you were saying, how like we feel like we need to be right, we need to justify and validate rather than just be as like aspirational shoot for the moon, um, you know, type, type decks. Yeah, so but I would question like, do we feel like we have to or is it because the systems put in place have mandated that be the case in order to acquire funding? Right? Yeah, Janice, I was just going to say that I think the one of the things that I think is so important is to each individual person needs to interrogate the way that they are evaluating things. Like the fact that Janice knows that like, I have to put my team side here. I have to have links to my projections. Like the fact that there is such a clear difference in outcomes based on those small choices, which sound trivial. And like, you know, it's kind of like when you get feedback on a resume, it's like everyone has an opinion, you know, just like on decks, people are like, put your team side here, there, whatever. But the fact that you have to make that decision based on who you are and the way that you are showing up to the conversation is messed up. And the reason that that leads to different outcomes is because people have those impressions and that bias is ingrained in us and it's in all mm -hmm. of us and so we all have to personally interrogate ourselves and figure out like am i making different decisions on different people based on factors other than their merit or other than what they are presenting to me uh, factually and i think that is a lifelong learning process um so it's nice for us to like all run around being like we support women founders and like you know we invest in underrepresented people like okay great but why like why are you doing that and why is there a difference like i think that two percent two and a half percent even five percent data points should be enough to say like okay obviously there's not parity because we're half the population and we're not getting a, a fraction of funding um but i i cannot tell you like i cannot talk to another person who says to me like i don't care if you're black brown blue or green like i just want to good companies like, I think green people are way underfunded. <laughs> really. So, you know, I, I think to me that just shows a real disconnect in understanding what the problem actually is. And it's like no one thinks that they are imposing those points of view on other people. Like no one thinks they're racist. No one thinks that they're sexist. But then they do things that happen. And so it's totally ingrained in the system. It's totally ingrained in how we are exposed to the world. And there are some experiences that like you will just never understand depending on what your identity is, but you can do the work personally to figure out like why are there disparities and what role can you play in changing them? We can. So Brie, yes, raised money or in the process yes. of raising money. Yes. And your yes. business is fundamentally, I mean, Radical Girl Gang is a woman oriented woman supporting and woman oriented business yeah. into a market where 95% of angel investors are men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And I'm happy to expand on that. I mean, <laughs> truly it's uh, been the hardest journey of my life. Um, you know, fundraising is hard. Being an entrepreneur is difficult. Being a young woman, first time founder, uh, the cards are not in my favor. And then add on top of that, the fact that we're building a business that is completely woman centric in a market that I'm going to understand 
much more intimately oftentimes than who I'm speaking to on the other side of the conversation, which tends to be old white men, um, just to be frank. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely something that I've experienced firsthand. Fortunately, I will say, um, I mean, you know, we have to make so much progress, but there are good people out there. Um, you know, I, there are great investors. There is there is change happening in the VC ecosystem. That being said, I think going back to your original question, Holly, we do not have time to wait for the amount of change that we need in this system. I don't have time. I'm trying to run and scale my business and oh, I need yeah, to get today. more capital. Exactly. And mm -hmm. at the rate of change that we're seeing, well, funding to women founders just dropped to 2.2% in the first eight months of this year, which is the lowest it's been in five years. So my message to the folks who are, you know, watching this and, and kind of trying to figure out this ecosystem is to me, the future is alternative sources of capital. Um, as an entrepreneur, something that, you know, I'm really passionate about is building systems that are created by the people that they're also supposed to serve. I have absolute hope and faith that VC will continue improving because I know many of the change makers on that side. And I fully agree with Lisa, having more women represented in leadership positions and writing checks is a huge part of this. That change is happening slowly, but it is happening. At the same time, it doesn't make sense for us to try to fix broken systems that were not made to support women. They were not made to support women and they certainly were not created to support women of color. Um, so for me, as I'm looking towards the future, I'm actually really excited. Um, Radical Girl Gang, I will share here, is actually going to be launching our first ever crowdfunding campaign on Republic in a week. Um, and so for me, <laughs> thanks, y'all. So for me, like this decision is a really personal one. Um, it reflects the values of our company. Um, and it feels really good to be able to raise money in a way that, like Heather said, is democratizing access to people and making these types of opportunities available to folks who can invest anything from $100 to $5,000 or beyond. Um, it makes it more authentic so, to your brand and more authentic exactly. to the girl gang. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I think uh, for, for me on my journey, a huge part of this has been, you know, real talk with women founders, you need to be creative about how you're getting capital. Um, yes, you can explore the VC route. Yes, you can explore angels. Yes, you can look at loans. Um, although we tend to get approved less with uh, worse interest rates than men. Um, but I think as we look towards the future, there's a lot of innovation that has yet to be seen even um, from these platforms that are uh, creating solutions that hopefully are also being built you know, by the kind of end user as well to support us. Yeah, and Janice, I'm thinking about, you know, what you were just talking about with like, we need to be able to see people that have done this and have had outcomes, right? I mean, like the 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 power of mentorship is the is the is the I mean, if you can see it, you go, okay, I see the path. I I I know the the pebbles in the in the in the river to to walk on. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question about um you have this awesome article, I think that you wrote for HBR about the model minority, right? Where, oh, Janice, did you mute? Oh yeah, you're muted. I'm here. Yeah, and, and I just love this, I, this, this like, like because you're at the table. And so let's say that in this circumstance, we have two and a half percent of the, the companies that are founded by women, right? And that's, are they then, they have to be this perfect version and 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 be the the male oriented ceo or something like that like lisa was saying like pump up my numbers and try to imitate that or can there can there be a more authentic version and i think it depends on i think there are layers of authenticity similar to how there are different layers of authenticity with friend groups right like you have those you know pajamas on a sunday morning doesn't matter where the cats and dogs are type of friends that can come over and you feel perfectly comfortable with that because you have that level of trust. And then there are the friends that you feel like you need to be a little bit more dressed up for or what have you, right? And I think the same thing applies with when you're raising capital. So while it would be great, you know, 
to sort of stay in that 100% truth. I think that there are just different parts that have to be highlighted depending on the core thesis of the investor. So for me, I don't even think about it as I'm a black woman owned business mm -hmm. going out and raising capital. When I raised the one point, well, it was 1.2, but now 1.6 after Google's investment, it was really more about how do I show that this is a viable business, that the timing aligns so perfectly for what we've been building, that even if you have that bias in place, it's irrefutable that this is a $100 million company minimum, and that if you get on board, you'll get your return significantly faster than what the stats are saying, and that you know there is that ability to have that positive pattern matching. I think when it comes to being, you know, and that HBR article you're referencing, I was discussing, mm -hmm. you know, the negative implications of having to be a corporate model minority because coming from defense contracting, uh, which was where the bulk of my career was in, you know, it was um, the opposite of me, right? And that oftentimes was a challenge. And instead of sort of staying in my truth, I deviated, if you will, and instead leaned towards trying to react to an overrepresented segment's fear of my presence versus leveraging that for my own advantage or just working somewhere else, quite frankly. Yeah. So I think when it when you're using that logic into venture capital, it's just finding the right VCs. You know, we have incredible investors like Mac Venture Partners, you know, Dana Wright and Elisa Sepulveda are really pushing for um, more inclusive practices for not just the firm, but also all of their portfolio companies. And having mandates like, you know, we want someone that is in a C-suite position that isn't just marketing, um, that identifies as underrepresented, that's a that's powerful, right? And to Bree's point, where your money goes is really what shows what you're prioritizing. So for me, I think it's less about the trope of being a model minority and really reclaiming that power as someone with a viable business that is scalable and going places to say, you do not fit our values investor. I love that. So I, I will that. leave you out of the opportunity and spend time with those that really see and will also help us get to that $100 million mark. I love that. So this idea of you don't invite me to the table. I invite you to my table. If you know, if you're, if you're part of this, uh, if you're if you're uh, living your values and living values yeah with exactly yeah. I think that you know and your first question about you know what needs to change I think it's just honestly looking authentically at the power structures mm -hmm. right in the space that I'm in with you know HR tech and everything we're hearing about the great resignation on a daily basis yeah. and what it really is you know boiled down and looking at it objectively is employees reclaiming that they do not need to risk burnout. They don't need to have a three hour commute and then go home and take care of their families. They can actually work from home and have some semblance of balance. And I think that applies here where, you know, women and underrepresented founders should come to investor conversations with their own criteria and be willing to cut the meeting short if they're not in alignment with their values instead of sort of letting the um, the cycle persist the way that it is. And to, to add to Janice's point, which I absolutely agree on, uh, one thing we tell our, and this, this goes to anybody in the audience uh, who's looking to raise, diligence is a two-way street. Um, it's, you should not only be on the receiving end of that diligence, you should be doing the diligence yourself. And when I say do, 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 do the diligence, I'm not just saying speak to the founders in the portfolio that are doing well. I'm saying talk to the founders in the portfolio that didn't do well and see how that mm -hmm. investor reacted, see what their response was, see how they helped them in times of need. So like what I, when I, when I say dil, dil, diligence is a two-way street, understand how that investor acts in times of, of certainty, in times of uncertainty, in times of good, and in times of bad. I think you're going to learn a lot more from a failed portfolio company um, than you will from a successful one. 
And so I think it's really important to recognize that your investor, it's a marriage. It should be, you know, it's generally like a seven to 10 year relationship. It's a marriage in good times and bad, you are together. So ensure that the partner that you choose to be your financial partner is a partner that you can sustain a, a long-term relationship with. And just make sure that at the very early stages that you are aligned in terms of your mission, in terms of your vision, in terms of who you're gonna be working with and how you're gonna be working and the styles of that. And so that's just one thing that I see founders too quick to make the decision of, they just accept the first check that comes in. Like the, like the term sheet, excited. just the terms on the yeah. term sheet are all that matter, right? As opposed to like, cause I think of- There's so much more. Yeah. All of us take so seriously, you know, the relationship with a co-founder. Oh, that's, you know, you would do so much due diligence about that person and probably know them for years and years. But yeah, it's I, very few people, spend much time um, doing that kind of due diligence with early stage uh, funding partners. And I'm sure all of my VC friends are going to be disappointed in what I'm about to say, but right now it is a founder's market. So if you are a founder and you are raising, you have options, you have more options than you've ever historically had. So make sure you're making the right decision into who you want to partner with and that it is the right, um, it is the right VC or angel, whoever it might be investing, um, because it, you should look at this as a, as a long-term partnership. So I wanted to uh, throw a question to to our founders. So Bree and and Janice. So you've now gone through this journey and raised money, and you are, you know, you, you've done this. If you can go back to, and and give you, oh my goodness, uh, if you can go back and and there, you know, give yourself advice or, you know, uh, somebody's uh, little sister that is going through this you know, that they're, they're getting ready to do it. What would you, what, what would be the wise counsel that, that, cause you have a scar tissue now from having done this, right? You know, you've been to battle. You've, uh, Janice has updated her slide deck 450 <laughs> times, you know, you, you've done this. And so what would you go back and say, you know, don't take this so seriously, take this more seriously, expect this time. Mm -hmm. What would, what would be your, Brie, why don't you go first? Sure. Yeah, I think one of the first things I would kind of say to myself or my hypothetical little sister would be kind of going back to what Janice mentioned about the power dynamics. As soon as you can sit across the table from someone and reclaim your power, especially as an overlooked founder, the game changes. Um, and not just in terms of how you're feeling in that conversation, but how you go about building your business. And that's totally been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's your really, dadgum business, right? Yeah, what? it's your business. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's your business. And these people are fortunate to have you come with this incredible opportunity to them. We know that not all VCs, most VCs are not necessarily visionary. A lot of VC investments are happening based off of matching to companies we've seen, industries that we've seen, concepts we've seen, founders we've seen. So Oftentimes, it's the most visionary and highest potential founders that actually get overlooked by that system. Um, the sooner you can really take that to heart and know that and be able to move forward through rejection, through, through the good meetings and the bad, the easier the process becomes. I will also say, uh, you don't just like start fundraising. I did not know that. I thought, you know, I had this amazing traction from my first year of bootstrap business. Uh, I thought it would go, you know, smoother, just kicking off. What I would advise to people is really to actually spend weeks, if not months, before you intend to fundraise to plan it all out, project manage it, um, get meetings set up, work on building initial relationships, mm -hmm. and to make it really, really tight as well. Like a, like a um, quiet so trying, phase? What? Like a, a quiet phase kind of leading exactly. up to it? Yeah. Exactly. And then basically when you launch your round, it, a lot of it is kind of unfortunately about the momentum. So that's kind of why I'm bringing that up. I think just the time that you're trying to raise and being as impactful and productive as you can in that time, which of course can be challenging because we're usually running the business at the same time. So it's much easier said than done. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I think thing that I've just been reflecting on more is, you know, women just need to build even more resilient companies. We're already incredible founders. And one way that this journey can be a little bit easier and more, more um, you know, a little bit easier to navigate is by building businesses that are generating revenue faster. Um, and so for us, one way that we've been doing that as a marketplace, which is 
traditionally a lower margin, higher volume business that's going to take years to scale is by building into our in-house line, which is higher margin and helps us bring in immediate mm -hmm. revenue that way. So even being strategic about how you are planning and looking at your business, if you're not seeing that money yet, how can you build revenue and get some cash in your pocket while you're still going through the fundraising process? Yeah, you and, and Janice both uh, boot started off uh, bootstrapping, right? Yeah. I think you muted again, Janice. No, I just stayed on mute. Brie was still sharing. But yeah, I bootstrapped as well. I don't want to overstep though, Brie. Oh, no, I'm all I'm all wrapped up. That's all I've okay. got. I'm always very sensitive to that from my corporate background of not interrupting other women <laughs> uh, when they're taking up rifle oxygen. I think on top of what you were saying, a few things come to mind. Building up your network of allies is really important. So whether that is, you know, other women or people from an overrepresented segment of the VC population, making sure that you have your network of allies to really help you understand the game that you're entering into. Um, look at that cat, so cute. Um, I would also say, get strategic with it. That's a big thing. To Bree's point, people kind of assume that you can jump in and just say, hey, everybody, I'm raising this amount, and then the money will just fall from the sky. That's not actually, I mean, it happens for some, and that's great, and congratulations to those of you that um, have that. But for others, it's really important to set up that strategy. Think about when you want to go out and raise, how much, at what valuation, what is your employee equity pool? I mean, all of these other pieces so that when you're in fundraising mode, all you're thinking about is just qualifying, right? Again, making sure that you have investors that are aligned to your values and the direction in which you want to take the company. Um, I would also, for me, honestly, what helped was getting more centered in my own self-identity and then raising. That first, you know, couple of years, especially when you're building your business, me as a first time founder, first generation American, um, moving to, you know, Austin with no friends, family or support system, there was a lot to learn, right? And I found that the more time I spent protecting my mental health, really thinking about my self identity, what feels more centered and aligned to me for who I actually am, the better the pitches were. You know, like the minute I just really got comfortable and I was like, honestly, I've been meaning to rock some medium box braids for the last year and I haven't done it because I wasn't sure if that would be professional enough for VCs. And the moment I said, don't care, a little bit more intensely than that, but same mm -hmm. point, um, my energy shifted because I just felt like I was in true alignment across all aspects of my life. And that helped me feel more um, defensible so that if the VC says, you know, we don't see this going somewhere. You can hear that feedback and really not take it personally, but see it as an opportunity to either modify your deck, um, which leads me to another point. And this might be a little controversial, oh, but I love it. sometimes you're getting the no because there's something in your deck or the way that you're talking about your business that isn't actually aligned to getting institutional funding. It's not because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah. I think the more that you can do to make your business indefensible and really make sure that when you're getting that feedback, of course, you'll hit, get hit with microaggressions. And of course, there will be that bias that takes place because the stats show that. But still being able to get some gifts in the feedback outside of that noise and say, OK, the last like six VCs that I've pitched have all said this one thing in their like Dear John breakup email. I think that there's actually something here. So if I'm tired of hearing this, what can I do in my communication or my go to market strategy or what have you to mitigate that risk in advance so that we're already answering it? And now they have to come up with another question or just agree that we're mind readers and intuitive as women are and have a viable business that they should fund. Right. So I think that's and then the last piece I would say, because we're growing and scaling pretty quickly, is just fire fast. Mm, yes, <laughs> that's it. I have a, I have some tactical advice for, for Bree and Janice's um, you know, hypothetical sisters um, as, as somebody who raised myself and have been, you know, 
the one writing the check as well, is, is building your bench. Make sure you have a strong advisory network and um, you know, make sure that you are leveraging that network. And I mean leveraging by learning, um, you know, plugging into what Jan like Janice is like, make sure you have a mentor, make sure you have people that you look up to, that you respect, that have done something similar that you can learn from because there's a ton of learnings around the, along the way. So building your bench, building your mentor network, building your advisory board, that's really helpful. And then that will lead to, um, this is my other tactical piece of advice is warm intros. Warm intros go a very, very long way. Mm -hmm. Chances are this day and age, everybody has like one or two degrees of separation to any VC or any in investor. So really understanding what is the connection between you or your company and that, that person's portfolio or that, um, that institutional portfolio, uh, trying to get a warm introduction can go a very, very long way. And also do your, do your research. Like so many times we'll get, we'll get pitches that just don't fit into our thesis or are at a different stage than we're used to investing in. And that's wasting your time. That's wasting the investor's time. So really do the research and find the companies that the investor has invested in that align with what you're looking to build. Um, and I'd say, you know, those are just some good tactical pieces of advice for people who are looking to raise in the future or currently raising is like a warm intro goes a very, very long way. And there's so much learning. So, you know, build that bench. Heather, but, I was gonna, you, yeah. you're closing in on our last word. No pressure. Yeah, um, yeah I just what wanted to, to like second Janice's point about, um, about focusing on making your business and, you know, rock solid. I think um, I saw a really good quote recently from an amazing woman founder who's on my Instagram feed, but there's a lot of them. So of course I can't remember who it was, but um, it was something, you know, to the effect of like, if you're so focused on attempting to shatter the glass ceiling, you're never going to make it to the ceiling to shatter um, without actually focusing on the path to get there. And so it is important for us to keep talking about the importance of funding women and call out bias when we see it. Um, but also if I get asked to be on another panel about funding women without also being asked to be on a panel about financial technology or, you know, one of the other things I know a lot of shit about, I'm going to scream. So I think like it is so important to like see these things and be vocal about them, but it's also important to do your job and grow your business and make sure that you are that amazing entrepreneur that we can all look up to um, and be a part of that because it's, you know, we don't have time. Like, we don't have time to be focusing on this without also, you know, building the things that need to be built. Yeah, there's too much work to be done, right? Where we started the conversation. Yeah, there's, and if we're going to go get to that 10x of where we are today, we got to go build some badass businesses, right? <laughs> yes. But I know you guys are doing that. Heather yeah. and Lisa, thank you for funding them. And Bree and Janice, thank you for being them. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. Thanks for having us. With that, we'll turn it over to the powers that be. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much for this conversation, uh, for just sharing your perspectives and experiences. It was a really great panel. Um, Heather, I definitely need to find some fintech event to plug you into next year. Thank you. Um, but that's a really, really good point, and I'm really glad that you made it. Um, and that that was that really stood out for me, and I hope a lot of people in the audience as well. So, thank you guys all for for donating your time to kind of shed some more light on this issue. And I hope I'll see you guys all later this afternoon as well. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.